Dear Rose. A Sweet Southern Romantic Comedy. Written by Suzanne Ash. Chapter 1. Rose. Explain to me again why we are doing this now. I stare at my father, who's pulling bags and boxes out of the closet in my grandmother's room. Grandma Iris has been gone for three years, and no one has touched this room. But for whatever reason, my dad has gotten it in his head that it's time to clear everything out. And of course he's chosen the one time my mother and sister Lily are gone, which leaves only me to help dig through decades of clothes and memories. It's time. He turns and pulls open drawers of the dresser that still hold many of my grandmother's clothes and photo albums. The handle breaks off, and the drawer only comes halfway out. Here, let me. I walk to his side and jiggle the wooden box the way I remember Grandma Iris did. It slides all the way out until it drops to the ground, socks and old photo albums sliding across the floor. That's going to have to go. My dad shakes his head. We can fix it. I scoop everything into a pile and slide the back panel of wood back into the grooves. That won't do. We'll have to get a new dresser. Dad shakes his head. Why? My father sighs and turns to look at me. Because I'm not having any luck hiring someone to replace Kurt. I've talked to everyone in Linden I can think of and put out feelers through the county. No takers. What does that have to do with Grandma's dresser? I ask, feeling lost. I'm hoping if we can offer someone free room and board, we'll be able to find a new foreman. Or at least a decent ranch hand. Understanding dawns on me. I'd hoped he'd given up on the crazy idea of needing another man to help run the ranch. Apparently, I was wrong. I. Don't even start. I know what you're thinking, Rose. But with me and your mom gone to show the horses and head to races all over the southeast, he shrugs and plops on his mother's tall bed. I can handle it. And I have Lily to help me. I don't remember how often we've had this conversation. More times than I can count on my fingers, that's for sure. Why won't this man get it in his stubborn head that I, a woman and his daughter, am perfectly capable of running two oaks? I've shadowed him since I've been old enough to walk and worked alongside him since I've been able to hold a hay fork. You'd think he'd noticed how capable I am along the way. I guess that's asking too much of the old man. I really thought that you and Max. Don't start, Dad. Max and I are friends. And in case you didn't notice, he's engaged to be married. To an actress. You know that boy won't be happy in Hollywood. My father shakes his head in disgust. Are you sure you two can't make up? With Max, I'd know Two Oaks is in good hands. I'm pretty sure Maeve wouldn't appreciate that. The up-and-coming actress grew up with us in Linden and was Max's sister's best friend. He'd carried a torch for her throughout high school, but since she wouldn't give him the time of day back then, he'd been happy to pretend to be my boyfriend. It had helped get my father off my back about finding a husband to help me run the ranch that's been in the Baker family for the past 230 years. Even if they get married, it won't last. Max needs to work the land. Dad stands up and grabs one of the photo albums at random and flips through it. He's looking plenty happy to me. And don't forget, he has his own family farm to fall back on. Not with his father selling off large chunks of land to those newcomers. What do they call themselves? Homesteaders? He scans the pictures of my grandfather and great-grandfather with some of Buttercup's ancestors. Barely a picture in those albums doesn't include a horse, and rumor has it that for the Baker men, horses always come first. Let's just say in my experience, those rumors are true. They seem to have good heads on their shoulders, and even you have to admit that they are hard workers, both of them. The young couple taking over part of the Lawrence farm is working from sunup to sundown to create their own little piece of heaven down by the creek. That land would have made some good horse pastures, Dad says. Seriously, Dad. Drop it. I'm not marrying Max, and we're not combining two oaks with the Lawrence farm. 
I stalk out of the room in search of a box to store those albums for now. When I return, my father is back to digging through the closet, bagging up Grandma Iris's dresses and the aprons you'd rarely see her without. Sorry about that, honey. I'm just worried about your future. My father drops a stack of aprons on the bed. I just want you to be happy. And taken care of. I get that. But I need you to realize that I can hold my own. Tell me one job on the farm I can't do or one task you won't trust me with. Dropping the box, I put a hand on my hip and stare my father down. I know you can, he says soothingly. Then why don't you trust me to run the show while you're gone? I do. All I'm saying is that you need help. It's a big place and a big responsibility. I'm fine. Besides, like I said, I have Lily. Answer me this, then. What if two of the Maras are ready to full at the same time? And you know how it goes. Something else will go wrong when you have your hands full, my father says. What are the chances of that happening at the same time? I ask. He barks out a dark laugh. Pretty high, if history is any indication. Did I tell you about the time your grandma and grandpa went to your great-aunt Wendy's wedding? You did. I'd heard the story of how my then-teenage father had to pull a foal by himself before rushing off to round up the herd that had gotten out through a hole in the fence. You managed it all, though. I did. By the grace of God. What if I'd noticed the horses were out before realizing Sandy was having a time foaling? We could have lost them both. I still think about what could have been. And trust me, there were plenty of times over the years when an extra pair of experienced hands would have come in handy. I can always call someone to come help. What about Caleb? I've been giving him riding lessons, and he's getting pretty good around the horses, I say. I'm not about to miss the chance to paint Caleb in a good light. I've had a crush on him since senior year in high school and we've gotten closer the past few months. Don't start that again. You know what I think of him and his folks. They're nice people and all, but... But what? They're newcomers? They don't have a farm or ranch that's been passed down through the generations since the first settlers arrived? My voice gets louder, and I'm basically shouting. I don't care. This kind of attitude grates my nerves, and I've had it with the attitude of people like my father. Dad harumphs. He's a nice enough guy. But? Caleb didn't grow up on a farm. Dad holds up a hand when I open my mouth to protest. He's a townie. He hasn't grown up around horses. He doesn't even know how to ride. He's not going to be much help when things go wrong. You need someone with experience. Someone to work alongside you. Not some boy without skills. He's learning. Give him a chance, Dad. He might surprise you. We'll see. For now, let's take this broken dresser down to the garage. We're both red-faced and out of breath when we make it off the porch. A familiar blue Ford F-150 comes down the long drive. We sit the dresser down, and he looks at the vehicle with Caleb behind the wheel. Speak of the... Dad. Want a hand with that? Caleb asks the moment he jumps out of his truck, wearing his usual jeans and Atlanta Brave sweatshirt and sneakers. We've got it. My dad lifts his corner of the dresser and motions for me to do the same. Caleb steps around me and helps dad carry the heavy piece of furniture to the back of the garage that serves as a workshop. We're clearing out my grandmother's room, I say. Dad thinks we need to offer free room and board to get someone to come work on the ranch. I roll my eyes, making sure my father can't see it. You're hiring? Caleb asks, surprised. We are. Having a heck of a time, too. Dad wipes his hands on his pants and looks like he's ready to head back upstairs to see what else needs to come out of the room. I'd be interested, Caleb says. I'm too stunned to speak. It's nice of you to offer, but we need an experienced ranch hand. Someone to work alongside Rose when I'm out of town. 
Dad turns to walk back to the house. I'm the man for the job. I've been helping Rose for a few weeks and am more than willing to learn what it takes to run a place like this. Caleb motions around, his eyes scanning the vast pastures, the barns and stables, and the house my great-great-grandfather built with timber grown and milled right here. You're serious. It isn't a question, and my father sounds genuinely surprised. I am, sir. It would be an honor to learn from the best. Caleb holds out his hand like he's ready to make a deal and shake on it here and now. Before I can step in to avoid what's sure to be a disaster, my father closes the distance between them. I think you and I should have a chat. Man to man. He puts his arm around Caleb, who shoots me a concerned look. I shrug my shoulders and watch the two of them leave, walking far enough up the drive to be out of hearing distance. I busy myself pulling the rest of the empty drawers from the dresser. When I pull the top one out, a bundle of letters falls to the ground. They must have gotten stuck in the back or in between the drawers. Picking them up, I recognize Grandma Iris's handwriting. I scan the envelopes and gasp when I realize they are addressed to me. Rose is written in large print across every single one of the plain envelopes. Chapter 2 Caleb What was that about? Rose asks when Mr. Baker and I walk back a few minutes later. She's still standing by the old dresser, holding what looks like a stack of old letters. I decided to give Caleb here a chance on the ranch. Mr. Baker claps my shoulder so hard I take an involuntary step forward and almost bump into Rose. And I appreciate you taking a chance on me. I won't let you down, I say, turning to look the older man in the eye. We'll see about that. This is on a trial basis. Let's give it a month and see how we both feel about it. Oh, and Rose, you're in charge of training Caleb. And the ranch hand I'll hire if I can talk anyone worth their salt into moving out here. He turns and walks into the house. What do you think you're doing? Rose spits out between clenched teeth the moment her father is out of earshot. Getting a job on two oaks. I grin, feeling pleased with myself. It's kind of brilliant, don't you think? We get to spend more time together, and it gives me a chance to get on your dad's good side. Rose shakes her head, dark curls bouncing in all directions. She huffs and puts the letters on top of the dresser that still sits in the drive and uses the ever-present hair tie on her wrist to pull the curls up into some sort of knotted mess on the top of her head. It looks surprisingly cute, especially with the few wild strands that refuse to get caught up framing her face. I'm tempted to bend down and kiss that pretty nose of hers. But I know better than to try something like that. Especially here on Two Oaks in front of her family. You do realize he'll do what he can to make sure you'll fail this trial thing of his, Rose says, tucking one of the wild strands behind her ear. I can handle myself. Besides, you said I'm getting pretty good around Buttercup. Rose's mare was bigger than I expected and I'd about tripped over my feet backing out of the stable when we first met up close, but I've gotten more comfortable around her and several of the other baker horses. For someone in his late twenties who hadn't grown up around horses, I'm holding my own. At least I think I am. Buttercup is the least of your problems. Wait until you meet Diabolo, Dad's prized stallion. Rose motions to the far pasture where a dark horse gallops from one end of the fence to the other. Don't worry. I can handle myself. And I have you to teach me. What could go wrong? You have no idea, do you? Rose proceeds to recount a variety of horse-related injuries either she or someone she knew had suffered over the years. If you two are done having your little coffee clutch over there, Rose and I have some work to do. Unless you want to start today, Mr. Baker calls out to us from the porch. I didn't notice him stepping back out. Does tomorrow work for you? I ask, glancing at the time on my phone. I'm due to start my afternoon shift at the grocery store in half an hour. That works. We start at 5.30 in the morning. Horses like their breakfast early, Rose's father shoots back. I'll be here, I promise. Let me help you finish moving this dresser, and I'll get out of your hair. I move back to the side I tried to carry earlier and wait for the older man to join me. Rose is standing behind him, 
rolling her eyes again, and I have to bite my lip to keep from laughing before we lift the antique piece of furniture that's much heavier than it looks. I don't know how he and Rose got it down the stairs and out the door. When we finally set it down in the back of the large garage next to the farmhouse, it dawns on me that I may have bitten off more than I can chew when I jumped at the chance to work at Two Oaks. One look at Mr. Baker, and I know that backing out isn't an option. Not if I want a shot at dating his oldest daughter. Everything go okay closing this door? Dad asks when I stop by the house to drop off my brother. The grocery store stays open until 9.30, and I barely make it back to my apartment above by 10 most nights. Everything went fine. The money's in the safe, ready for you to take to the bank tomorrow, I add before he can ask. No matter how often Patrick and I have closed the store together, he still checks behind us. Not that my brother has been much help. Good. Business has been picking up. I've been getting a little worried with Lex expanding that farm stand of his. People sure are getting into all this farm fresh stuff. Doesn't mean we can't start offering it. We could talk to some of the farmers around Linden and see if someone wants to bring things in. The idea had been floating around in my head since before Lex built the stand and this wasn't the first time I'd mentioned it. It's not that easy, but I'll see what I can do. It's my father's standard response whenever I bring up anything about making changes to the store or the way we do business. Sounds good, I say. By the way, there's something I would like to talk to everyone about. Both of my parents are looking at me and even Patrick puts his phone down. Take a seat and stay for dinner, my mother says, pointing to the place she still insists on setting for me for dinner each night. Mr. Baker at Two Oaks offered me a job on the ranch, and I'd like to take it. I sit down. You have a job, my mother says, putting a large heaping of mashed potato on my plate before topping it with Salisbury steak and enough gravy to set the whole meal afloat. No way. Patrick stares at me like I announced I'm moving to another planet or something. All my father does is shake his head disapprovingly. It's on a trial basis and most of the work will be early in the day. Since you and mom opened this door, I think we can make this work. I'll be back for the rush and Patrick can close. I look at them each in turn. I don't think that's a good idea, my father says. Pat can handle himself. I glance at my twin for support. He's back to looking at his phone, pretending he isn't part of this conversation. We run the store as a family. You and Patrick will take over one day. I don't see the point of you playing around with horses when you should learn the ropes of tracking inventory and keeping accounts. Dad sits back and grabs his water, his eyes trained on me. Besides, aren't you a little too old for all that nonsense? I'm not playing with horses. I'm figuring out how to run a ranch and work with a prize herd that's worth more than the store. You're working on someone else's property when you should focus on building the family business. We only want what's best for you, my mother adds, taking my father's hand and looking at me like I'm 18 and talking about taking off to travel the world or something. What if that isn't taking over the grocery store? I ask. Besides, I know how to keep inventory, and we have Mr. Beatty to do the accounting. I've worked for you since I've been old enough to bag groceries. Don't you think it's time I see if there's something else I might like better? I ask, looking from my mom to my dad. Of course she says. If that's what you want. We want what's best for you, my father adds, echoing my mother's words. And that's running the store together. As a family. We're putting down roots here in Linden, and the store is something you can pass on to your own children. Build some generational wealth. Something I never had growing up. What if I want to build something of my own? Figure out what I'm good at? I ask. Pat can take over the store. What you're good at is running the store and keeping an eye on your brother. We need you. End of story. My father gets up and puts his plate in the sink. Patrick follows to do the same and the two of them disappear into the den. A minute later, the TV comes on, the sportscaster announcing the scores of today's games. Give him some time to come to terms with this, my mother says. That was quite the surprise you dropped on us. Are you sure this is something you want to do? It is, Mom.
This isn't some flight of fancy. I've spent a lot of time on Two Oaks, and I like it there. I can feel my face lighting up with excitement. I love being outside and working with my hands. Seeing the difference I make with the horses. My mother smiles back at me. I've noticed you sneaking off any chance you get. But isn't working at the store similar? You work with your hands a lot, stocking and cleaning. And we're all making a difference in the lives of our customers. This is different. I don't know how to explain it. I feel free when I'm out on the pasture, working in the fresh air. And honestly, it's nice not having to deal with customers. The people have always been my least favorite part of the job. It's why I take any chance I get to work in the back or restock after we've closed. It's why I'm so good at all the admin tasks. Any chance to go hide in the back office. I'm surprised my parents haven't realized that. I see. She takes both of our plates and walks them to the sink. Running hot water over the plates, she starts washing the dishes. I grab a towel to dry. It used to be a nightly habit growing up. A moment when we could work together and chat. I really want to give this a try, Mom. What I don't say is that I want to try this before I get stuck in a life I can't get out of. Are you sure? What about your brother? I don't know about Patrick closing by himself. She hands me the first of the plates, concern shining in her eyes. My brother left town and got in with the wrong crowd a few years ago. Now he's a man with a record, and Linden Grocers has been the only job he's held longer than two weeks. He'll be fine. And really, you can't expect me to clean up behind him our entire lives. It's time he holds his own, don't you think? I ask, drying another plate and putting it away in the cabinet. Maybe. Mom walks back to the table and clears off the last of the dishes. It'll all work out. You'll see. I smile at her encouragingly, hoping I felt as confident as I sound. I hope it does. Promise me you won't rush into anything and that this is really something you want to do for yourself. Of course it is, I say. Are you sure? You're doing this for yourself, not for Rose, she asks, and I'm not sure I know how to answer that question. I still don't know it when I walk into my dark apartment and set an early alarm for my first day at Two Oaks. Chapter 3 Rose Race you to the creek, I call to my sister, who's riding next to me. Let's make it interesting. Over the creek and to the big pine that got hit by lightning, she says. She's riding Daisy, a young mare, who's not as fast as Buttercup, but is hands down a better jumper. You've got it. I waste no time to spur Buttercup on. We race head to head across the pasture, both of us at a full gallop. As expected, Lily and Daisy take the lead across the creek, but Buttercup catches back up to within a nose length at most when we make it to the large pine tree that had somehow survived a direct lighting strike and years later still bears the scar to prove it. Nice jump, I call out to my sister, hopping off Buttercup, slightly out of breath. Thanks. I'll miss this girl, but she'll make a good competition horse for some young girl. My younger sister lets Daisy roam through a patch of thick grass to eat her fill, and I do the same with Buttercup. When are you heading back? I ask, plopping down in the grass. Lily takes a seat on a log, stretching out her legs and crossing her riding boots in front of her. Leaning back, she lets the sun shine on her face, soaking up the sun as soon as we get back. I'm meeting with my study group tonight. Exams are coming up. How's that going for you? Still enjoying business school? I ask. I am. Accounting isn't my favorite, but if nothing else, it's opened my eyes for what's out there for me. Who knows where I'll end up? Two Oaks will always be your home, you know that, right? I look up at her, trying to decipher how she really feels about moving away and building a life for herself. I appreciate that, but Two Oaks will be yours one day because that's the way it has always been. The ranch went to the oldest son. Or in our case, to me, the older of two daughters. That doesn't mean you can't live here. I didn't like the idea of losing Lily. 
We were less than a year apart and had grown up doing everything together. Until she went off to college, while I stayed to take classes at the local community college that would help me manage the family horse ranch. Lily jumps up and laughs. Right. Two Oaks barely stays afloat as it is. There's no way it can support two families. So, you're thinking of starting a family already? What's his name? I tease. Lily twirls around on the top of her toes. It's not like that. She turns to look at me, her cheeks rosy, and I don't think it's just from the sun and the ride. Tom. He's an agribiz major. From around here? I ask, my curiosity piqued. He's not the first guy she's dated, but the first one she's kept a secret. Until now. Lily shakes her head. He's from Kentucky. Horse country, I say, and Lily sits down next to me. Not really. At least not where he's from. He's interested in locally grown food. Farm to table stuff. You should introduce him to Lex. He's all into that stuff now. Have you been to his farm stand? Lex would inherit the Clark farm from his grandparents one of these days and had put a lot of time and effort into diversifying the family's dairy farm. I have, and you're right. Tom would love it. If I brought him home. Not ready for that? I ask, and Lily shakes her head. Not yet. Though there's a guest room now that Grandma's stuff's cleared out. Her eyes sparkle with interest. Don't get your hopes up. Dad has plans for that room. Right. Still trying to hire someone to help around the place. When's Dad going to realize you can handle it without a man on site? Lily asks. Probably never. I sigh. There's no point fighting something you can't change. Did I tell you about the letters I found? No. In Grandma's room? What are they? Old love letters? Lily looks at me expectantly. She's always been a hopeless romantic. I haven't opened them yet. Why not? Lily asks. I don't know. It feels weird. And it had been surprisingly painful to stare at Grandma Iris's handwriting. After three years, the grief of losing her shouldn't hit me so hard, but for some reason, it does. Every time I look at the letters, or think of them, the loss of her hits me like a ton of bricks. Weird how? Like you're invading her privacy? I shake my head. That's not it. They are addressed to me. Hmm. No love letters then. I wonder why she didn't give them to you sooner. Or told Dad to give them to you after, you know. A shadow falls across Lily's face, and somehow, it's comforting to know I'm not the only one grieving the woman who'd been such a huge presence in our lives growing up. Not that I don't think my father misses her, but he hides it so well and rarely speaks of his mother. What do you think is in them? Lily asks. I have no idea. Part of me wonders why Grandma Iris felt the need to write me not one but an entire stack of letters, only to stick them into a drawer. It's almost enough to make me want to ride back home and rip them open. Someone's coming. She jumps up and points to the side-by-side -side that's making its way across the pasture toward us. Let's get the horses. Don't want them to get spooked and run off. I was in no mood to run all across the large back pasture to catch Buttercup. I think it's Mom. Lily walks up to Daisy slowly and grabs her reins. I wonder what she's doing here. I put my hand over my eyes, blocking the sun, to get a better look. I wanted to spend a bit of time with my girls, my mom says when we spread out the old horse blanket she'd brought. And I figured the two of you would be hungry. We haven't done this in a while. Picnic lunches had been a favorite growing up. It was a way for the three of us to spend time away from the hustle and bustle of Two Oaks. I didn't realize how much I missed this. Lily puts down the cooler and pulls leftover fried chicken, potato salad, cucumber slices, and a large jar of lemonade from the cooler. My mother produces a loaf of freshly baked sourdough bread and cuts it into thick slices before slathering them in butter. Me too. 
It's nice to have both of my girls here. Mom hands us each a plate and the three of us dig in. I noticed Caleb is spending a lot of time on the ranch, Mom says a little while later. Dad hired him to help out and has me training him, I say, trying to think of something to change the topic. I think there's a little more to it than that. I see the way the two of you look at each other. How's that? All googly-eyed? Lily asks, and I shoot her a dirty look. Like they care, for each other, Mom says, a small smile, playing around her lips. We're friends, I say. I hope it's a little more than that. I know it hasn't been easy for you seeing Max, get engaged, to Maeve out of nowhere. One day, the two of you were going on a date and boom, a few weeks later, we all watched him propose to her on live television. She shakes her head, looking at me, with pity in her eyes. It wasn't all that sudden, and it's for the best. He's happy. That's what's important. After years of deception, I can't exactly come out and admit that Max and I had been nothing more than friends who'd pretended to date to get our parents off our backs. Still. Breaking up is never easy, and if Caleb can help you get over the heartbreak with Max. Lily opens her mouth, and I give her a stern look and shake my head. Right, whatever. Like I said, Dad hired Caleb, and I'm trying to show him the ropes. Can we leave it at that? I ask. Of course. Whatever you need, honey. All I'm saying is that it's nice to see you happy. Both of you. Mom looks from me to Lily, a big smile on her face. We are. Or will be, Lily assures her, taking a sip of lemonade and reaching for another slice of bread. How's Caleb liking the work? Mom asks. He loves it, and he's getting comfortable around the horses. Except for Diabolo, but who can blame him? I'm not a hundred percent comfortable around my dad's prize stallion. Good. I think your father is surprised he's sticking around. The gleam in mom's eyes tells me she isn't. Does that mean he's dropping this silly idea of needing to hire another ranch hand? I ask. Mom shakes her head. Seriously? There's no need for that. I can manage two oaks while you're gone. I have Caleb and I'm sure Lily will come back if I need her. I look at my sister, who nods her approval. It's only a half-hour drive. I can be back here, lickety-split. Rose, you know that won't be enough. You need the extra pair of hands. Besides. Don't say it. I hold up my hand to stop her. Don't tell me that we need a man in the house while you and Dad are away. Chapter 4 Caleb What's next, boss? I ask Rose when we finish feeding the horses. Time to muck out the stalls. Rose rolls her eyes and pinches her nose. My favorite part of the day. I reach for the pitchfork and head in when Rose leads Buttercup outside. I'm halfway done scooping the horse apples into the wheelbarrow sitting just outside the stall when Rose returns. How's it going, stable boy? She leans against the side of the stall and watches me work. Almost done in here. Whose turn is it to dump the load? I ask, and she bursts out laughing. I shake my head. What are you? Twelve? I'll do it. By the time I return, She's scattered fresh straw across the stall and brought Buttercup back inside. The mare doesn't look too happy until she notices the extra ration of oats in the feed bucket. We work our way across the stalls, chatting, laughing, and ignoring the stench from the few steaming piles we encounter. Watch out, Rose calls out to me when I back into another empty stall, pulling the wheelbarrow. I narrowly miss the pitchfork that slid down from the wall where I propped it up. Instead, my foot lands on a huge pile of dung, and I lose my balance. A split second later, I'm sitting on my butt, trying to figure out what happened. The wheelbarrow is laying on its side. Thankfully, it was mostly empty, but a few of the smelly contents are spilling out the side. Rose is standing above me, laughing so hard she's holding her side. Finally, she calms down enough to hold out a hand to help me up. How'd you manage that? I look around me and at the state of my sneakers and my jeans. 
I have no idea. Here I thought I was getting the hang of this. You are. S.H. Stuff happens. Let's get you cleaned up. She reaches for a handful of clean straw and rubs it all over the bottom of my jeans, spreading the soft smelly stuff around. I've got it. I motion for her to stop and do my best to scrape what I can off my pants and shoe before rushing off to wash my hands. The end result isn't perfect, but it'll do until I get home to change. After my first day working on the ranch, I'd learned to keep a towel in the car to spread across the seat for situations like this. What happened to you? Mrs. Baker asks when I walk back across the yard to return to the barn. I slipped and fell. Are you sure? My daughter isn't playing tricks on you, is she? She used to do that to her sister. Mary smiles at me and shakes her head at the memory. I don't think so. Come with me. We'll find you something clean, and I'll have those washed and dried before you leave, Mrs. Baker says. That's not necessary. I'll just get those dirty as well, Mrs. Baker. Call me Mary, and it's no trouble at all. She walks off and motions for me to follow. This really isn't necessary, I say, walking behind her. Of course it is. Can't have you running around the place looking and smelling like that. Here, put this on. There's an old pair of boots in the mudroom. Mrs. Baker hands me a pair of denim overalls that look about three sizes too big. One look at her face, and I know there's no point arguing. My mom's got the same expression. I take off my pants and shoes and change into the overalls and boots, returning with my soiled items. Off you go. I'm sure Rose has more work for you. I'm sure you're right. I walk back to the stables, doing my best not to lose a boot. What happened to you? Rose asks, looking me up and down, her lips twitching. I ran into your mother. She insisted. I point to the overalls and boots. It's kinda cute. Not a bad look on you. Rose stops brushing Buttercup and walks up to me. Right. I shake my head and resist the urge to adjust the straps. Rose reaches up and runs her fingers through my hair. The feeling is incredible. It makes my hands itch. I reach up to tuck one of her curls behind her ear and lower my head to sneak a kiss. Rose? She takes a step back and bumps into Buttercup, who snorts in disapproval. Back here, Dad. She looks around before grabbing the hay fork I'd been using to spread out bedding that looked perfectly fine. I knew how to do that job. You two still aren't done with the stalls? Mr. Baker strode over, his eyebrows drawn together. Just wrapping things up and moving on to Diablo's stall, Rose says, handing me the tool. Caleb can take care of it. I need you to come look at something with me. Brush him while you're at it. He looks like he needs it. He motions for Rose to follow him. Right behind you, Dad. I'll just let Diablo out, Rose says. Caleb can take care of it, Mr. Baker says. He turns to me and looks me right in the eye. Right? Of course. No problem at all. Dad, it's Diablo. Rose walks in the direction of the stallion stall. I jog to catch up with her, almost losing a boot in the process. I've got this. Go with your dad, I say firmly. Are you sure? Rose looks at me, concern in her eyes. Of course. What do you think? I can't handle myself around him? I'm ticked off by her lack of faith in my abilities. This isn't my first rodeo. All right. Be careful though, he's easily spooked. Rose gives me one last worried look and follows her father out of the barn. Hey there, big boy, I say as I approach his stall. I take my time, making sure Rose and her father are well out of earshot before attempting to walk him out. The black stallion is a good bit taller than Buttercup and most of the other Maras and a bit wider. He's all muscle and attitude, but today, his ears perk up, and he looks at me curiously. It's just you and me today. What do you say, do a man a solid and behave for me? I clip in the lead rope, and to my surprise, he follows me into the lane without hesitation. Good boy. 
Wanna go get some air while I take care of your bachelor pad? I ask, keeping my voice even and soft. Aside from a brief stop to sniff one of his female companions that I can't blame him for, he is perfectly behaved. Maybe you just don't like Rose, I muse, earning me a snort. I swear Diablo rolls his eyes before taking off when we reach the small paddock. I take that as a yes, I call before heading inside to deal with his used bedding. What did you eat? I mutter, picking up a particularly large pile of dung. It's steaming and worse than anything else I've encountered. I gag, glad I'm the only person in the stable. There's a lot I like about this new job of mine, but shoveling horse dung isn't it. Unfortunately, it makes up a surprisingly big part of my day spent here on Two Oaks. At least Diablo's stall is the last, and while I definitely save the worst for last, I'm done by the time I spread a layer of clean straw across the floor. I'm ready to get him inside and get the job done before Rose returns, but Diablo has other ideas. The big boy isn't too fond of the thought of moving back inside the stable. He keeps stepping away from me until I grab a handful of hay cubes. The bribe works, and I clip the lead in while he's busy munching his treat. The promise of more makes him follow me calmly back into the stable until something spooks him. Easy, boy. I try to get out of the way, but he pins me against the wall, knocking the breath out of me. Rose's words from one of my first trips to the ranch comes to mind, and I stay calm. To my relief, Diablo dances to the right far enough for me to squeeze out. I look both ways, relieved neither Rose nor her father have returned. I get the stallion settled in his stall and toss him another handful of hay cubes. We manage that pretty well, I'd say. I grab the brush from a nearby shelf and join him. Doesn't it smell better in here? I ask, raising my hand to brush his mane the way I'd seen Rose do with Buttercup any time she brought her back inside. Before I can form another thought, I see the muscles in his hindquarter twitch. Diablo's leg shoots out and pain worse than anything I've ever felt shoots through me. I feel like I'm about to pass out from the pain, and something in the very back of my mind tells me that's a bad idea. Caleb. I hear Rose's voice before seeing her rush in, her father one step behind her, muttering something unintelligible under his breath. Chapter 5 Rose How's Caleb? Dad asks when I walk into the kitchen the next morning. Paperwork is spread out all across the old oak that's probably stood here as long as the house has. Sore, but he'll live, I say. No thanks to you. Rosemary Baker, you don't speak to your father like that. My mother's tone is as stern as the look she shoots me. She could turn a pot of boiling water to ice with that stare. Sorry. Caleb's fine. He'll be back to work tomorrow. Humph, my father sounds surprised, but keeps his head down, scanning the documents spread out in front of him. I told you, he's serious about the job. Even after you set him up to get hurt. That gets his attention. I did no such thing. What did you expect would happen when you told him to brush Diablo? I ask. You did what? My mom turns to look at my dad, and I'm glad he's now the recipient of her glare. I suggested he brush Diablo after he mucked out his stall. I said nothing about trying to do it in the stall itself and never mentioned his mane. My only mistake was assuming you'd actually trained the boy. Dad says, ignoring my mom and looking at me. I have been. Though I can't deny the guilt gnawing at me about not being there to keep this from happening. Which was totally my dad's fault. And if you hadn't called me away. What? You plan on babysitting him the entire time he works for us? That's not how this works, and you know it, Rose. I'm not babysitting him. I'm teaching him. It takes time. You're not. That's the point. Caleb says he's here to learn the ropes of this business. That's not going to happen if you keep babying him. I didn't do that to you or to your sister. My mother makes a grunting noise, covering it up with a cough. When I turn my head to look at her, she turns away and pretends to do dishes. I really haven't. He's doing everything right alongside me. You didn't have him handling Diablo, my father says. 
for good reason. You see what happened. I glare at him. If you'd had him move that horse and brush him down, he'd have learned to watch himself and I'm guessing, he would have picked up on the fact that you don't mess with his mane unless you're prepared to jump out of the way. Maybe, I concede, knowing that there's no sense in arguing when he gets his heels stuck in about something. I'll work on that this week. Good. Sit down and help me look through these applications. Dad slides a folder my way. What application? I ask, sliding out the kitchen chair and sitting down. Ranch hand. His look tells me what he doesn't. No sense in arguing about this either. At least not for the time being. I pull the papers out and skim through them, discarding one after the other. Not that there's a lot of them to begin with. People either have less experience than Caleb but always dreamed of being a cowboy, or they ask for more than we're prepared to offer. This guy here looks like the only viable candidate, I say a few minutes later. I agree. Dad looks pleased. Makes you wonder though, I reread his application. Sean Perkins, from Rockville, North Carolina. He's 27, right about Caleb's age and a couple of years older than me. He's got experience. What's setting off those alarm bells of yours, my father asks. He sounds a little too good to be true, don't you think? I ask. My father shrugs. Why would he come out here? Don't get me wrong, I love Two Oaks, but we're not the biggest or most prestigious outfit out there. And from what he's saying, this Sean guy actually has a good bit of experience. He could work anywhere. Why would he want to move to Linden? Maybe he likes the quiet country life, my mother says from the sink. That's a good question. His family has a ranch of their own. Maybe he's ready to get away and strike out on his own for a bit. Dad's trying his best to stay optimistic about his only viable candidate. Maybe. I still think Caleb is the better choice. I look Dad straight in the eye, sounding much more convincing than he did. He didn't do all that well the other day, Dad says. That was hardly his fault and even you have to admit that he's been learning a lot, all things considered. Not all of us are born with a horse waiting for us to climb on. True. He's a hard worker, I give him that. But. But what? I ask when he doesn't continue. Dad gets up and pours himself another cup of coffee, taking his time adding sugar and cream. I clear my throat after he spends a full minute stirring the contents. Here's the thing, Rosebud. I know how you feel about the man. He glances at me briefly before moving the spoon to stir his coffee some more. I'm not comfortable leaving the two of you alone here on Two Oaks. That's got to be the most old-fashioned and backwards thing I've ever heard. What do you think we're going to do? And how little faith do you have in me? His words hurt me more than I expected. And I'm surprised he picked up on all that. Caleb and I have been careful about how we act around each other when anyone else is in earshot. You don't deny it? It's Dad's turn to be surprised. I shrug my shoulders. We're friends. Oh please, a blind man can see that Caleb is carrying a torch for you, my mother says from the peanut gallery. And the two of you don't trust me around him? I ask, not trying to hide my annoyance. It's not like that. It's, not proper, my father says. You realize you sound like you're from the fifties, right? We're not as backward as you think, but don't forget. I was a young man in my twenties once. I shrug my shoulders and head outside before either of us says something we'll regret. Dinner's almost ready. Do you mind setting the table? My mother smiles when I come downstairs. After a ride on Buttercup, several hours of hard work, and a long, hot shower, I'm in a much better frame of mind. I'm on it. From habit, I grab four plates from the cupboard and return one to the stack. Lily has spent most of her time at college the past three years, but after each break, it takes me a while to get used to being a family of three. From the look on my mother's face, she noticed and feels the same way. She'll be back in a few weeks. I know. It's just been a strange couple of days. 
your dad? Mom stirs the stew she's had simmering on the back of the stove all day. I don't get him. He's not that old, but so backwards in his beliefs. I shake my head, putting the plates down with a little more force than absolutely necessary. Thankfully, it's sturdy stoneware. He's worried, that's all. He wants what's best for you. Right. I finish setting the table. I have to tell you, I agree with him when it comes to this particular situation. Seriously, mom? I'm not saying I don't trust you to do a good job running the ranch, but you do need help, and I'm not completely comfortable with the two of you here, by yourselves. You do realize we're two grown adults, I say, not believing what I'm hearing. You are, but you're not officially dating yet, and this is a small, old-fashioned town. People will talk. Let them talk, I say, my tone challenging even to my own ears. Rose, it's not going to happen. We won't leave the two of you here alone, which means you have two choices. Mom pulls cornbread from the oven and tips it out onto a plate. And those are? I ask, wondering what they've come up with aside from the obvious choice. Either you accept the new hire, or you can go on the road with Dad and I'll stay here to run things. Mom pulls a knife from the drawer. Turning to look at me, the knife in one hand, the other on her hip, she looks formidable. Even if the knife is a butter knife. My first instinct is to tell her how ridiculous I think the idea of her taking care of the horses is. She spends most of her day running the house, after all. But seeing her standing in front of me looking like some southern version of an Amazon, I decide it's in my best interest to keep my mouth shut. You think I'm not up to it? Who do you think ran things when you two were little? Mom asks, reading the words I'd bit back on my face. I guess you did. I'd never given much thought to what went on when I was little. Sure, Grandma Iris was around, but from what I remember, she traveled with my dad a good bit when I was little. She was the one with contacts and relationships that went back decades. Rumor had it she could sell any horse and make a hefty profit. Something smells good around here, Dad says, stepping into the kitchen in his socks. Wash up. Food's ready. Mom turned to slather plenty of fresh butter on the cornbread. As if by silent agreement, we drop the topic of who will stay to run two oaks and eat dinner together. When my parents head to the living room to watch the evening news, I walk to my room upstairs. I'm snuggled into my bed with a good book when my phone buzzes with a new text message. Lily, what was in those letters from Grandma? You never told me. Rose, I totally forgot about them. Lily, seriously? You're killing me, sis. Rose, I'll take a look now. Stay tuned. Lily, please do. Gotta run. Night, sis. I throw the covers back and pat over to my dresser. I'd stuck them in the top drawer when Dad called me down that day. It had seemed fitting, and that's where the bundle of letters had stayed ever since. I yawn and grabbed the entire bundle of envelopes. Walking back to bed and getting back under the warm quilt that had been passed down, I open the first one and begin to read. Dear Rose. I'm running out of time. Chapter 6 Caleb Excuse me, young man. Can you tell me where I can find jars of beef gravy? There's a new recipe I want to try. Usually, I'd make it from scratch. Far end of aisle 6 at about a level. I'll show you, I add when I see the glazed look in the older woman's eyes. Mrs. Martin is a regular customer of ours, and I'm surprised she doesn't remember my name or read it off the name tag my father makes all of us wear, himself included. Except his tag reads Mr. Montgomery, while my brothers and mine list our first names like we're still bag boys. When you're done, come help me stock the canned tomatoes, Dad says when we pass him. Will do. I show Mrs. Martin the gravy and wait patiently while she decides if she might need one or two jars for a recipe. I should have written it down. She shakes her head and digs through her purse like it will magically appear. I can look it up for you if you remember the name, I offer, pulling my phone from my back pocket. 
Mrs. Martin shakes her head. It's from an old church cookbook. I forgot I had it, but it has a lot of good recipes in it. Why don't you get two, then? The gravy lasts a good while, and if the recipe doesn't turn out, you can bring any unopened jars back. I cross my fingers and hope that she takes her jars and checks out. That's sweet of you to offer, young man. I'll be sure to put in a good word with your mother. She's raising a fine pair of boys. Grabbing the two jars, she puts them into her shopping cart and heads for the register where my mom's waiting to check out the next shopper. Nice work, son, Dad says when I join him. A large pallet of pasta sauce and canned tomatoes came in on the truck this morning waiting to be put on the shelves. It's what I do. I grin and grab a handful of small cans of tomato paste, backfilling their spot on the top shelf. Is it though? Dad mumbles, bending down to store the large cans of crushed tomatoes Mom uses to make her homemade spaghetti sauce. What's that supposed to mean? All the joy about the rare compliment from my father evaporates in an instant, leaving me feeling deflated. That helping customers hasn't been your focus lately. It's been this ranch thing. Cans land with a soft thump on the shelf. I'm here every afternoon and night, putting in my shift. I keep working to keep from staring at the man who raised me. You are. But don't think I didn't notice that you're dead on your feet most days? And this should have been stocked already. He motions to the trays of cans and jars remaining on the pallet my brother dropped in the aisle. The truck didn't come till this morning. It wasn't my fault no one else had gotten around to unloading it while I put in my six hours at Two Oaks. You weren't here this morning, he says. That's not fair, Dad. Caleb doesn't work the early shift, and I didn't jump on in when I first came in. Patrick walks up next to me and gets to work on putting the jars of pasta sauce away. I look at my twin brother, surprised by the sudden sign of loyalty. Thanks. That doesn't negate the fact that your brother's focus is split. Dad keeps slamming down the larger cans. This is bothering him more than I'd realized. It's not like he's out partying all night. He's doing what he loves when he's off work here. Think of it as a paid hobby. Pat turns to me. You are getting paid for all that work, right? I nod. It's less than I'm making here and I don't exactly need the money, but Mr. Baker insists on paying me for my time. All right. Let's give it a few more weeks and see how things go. I don't think it's a good long-term situation, though. I need you to focus on the store. Don't worry, I can handle it, I say to reassure him and myself. The three of us work in companionable silence for a bit and it doesn't take long to get everything stocked. When we're done, I walk the aisles, straightening up product and making a note of what needs restocking while Patrick takes over at the cash register when Mom and Dad head home. I keep thinking about Pat taking my side earlier. Despite being twins, we've never been super close, and when he took his little trip on the wild side, we grew even further apart. Usually, he does everything he can to point out my shortcomings. I can't help but wonder what this change in attitude is about. I look over to the register where Pat is busy checking out a line of customers who've come in to do their grocery shopping after work. Caleb, I'm so glad I ran into you. I jump back and knock over the display of canned soup my mom put together a few days ago. It's a pyramid that reaches up to my shoulders and most of the cans making up its construction tumble down and roll across the floor. I'm so sorry. I turn to look at Mrs. Baker, whose face has gone white. She's covering her cheeks with both hands, and there's panic in her eyes as we both survey the destruction in front of us. Totally my fault. I bumped into the display, I say, crouching down to survey the damage and clear a path before someone gets hurt. Mrs. Baker joins me on the floor and starts gathering cans, handing them to me as I rebuild the display. A few of the cans are dented, but a little creative rearranging and no one will be any wiser. Need help? Pat calls from the register. I shake my head when I see two more customers heading to the checkout line. I've got it. I can't believe I, Mrs. Baker hands me another can, and I stop her. This wasn't your fault, and you don't need to do this. I motion to the remaining cans, most of which rolled under shelves or farther down the aisle. 
I don't mind. Besides, you've been such a big help on the ranch. By the time Patrick comes over to help, we're almost done. With three pairs of hands, we have the pyramid restored to its former glory in no time at all. I appreciate the help, but this wasn't necessary, I say to Mrs. Baker while Patrick puts the last of the cans in place. It's the least I could do. How are you feeling, by the way? Still in pain? Mrs. Baker asks. It's a little sore, but not bad at all. Is there anything I can help you find? I ask, desperate to get her away from my brother before she says anything else. Mrs. Baker shakes her head. I'm fine. If I had to guess, I'd say you have quite the bruise. It'll be sore for a few days, but as long as there's no swelling, you'll be fine. If there is or it feels hot to the touch, I want you to go see a doctor. You got hurt? Patrick asks and I nod my head. It's no big deal. He got kicked by a horse. It happens, Mrs. Baker adds, not so helpfully, before walking off to finish her grocery shopping. That explains a lot, Patrick says, a huge grin on his face. What's that supposed to mean? I ask. I was wondering why you were shuffling around like an old man and avoided stocking the top shelves. I think earlier today was the first time you volunteered to run the cash register, too. I was starting to wonder if you were going senile. Glad it's just a bruise. He pokes into my thigh and it's all I can do to keep from yelling at him or slapping him across the face. Stop that, I bite out instead. And Pat, don't tell Mom. I don't want her to worry. Pat looks at me, a calculating look in his eye. Sure thing, but it's going to cost you. I'm on my way to the shower when my doorbell rings. I glance at the clock on my microwave. It's almost nine, much too late for a random visitor. My hand goes to the phone in my pocket, and when I pull it out, I realize it's dead. I throw on a pair of sweats and head to the door. Pulling it open, I'm stunned to see Rose standing in the hallway of Linden's one and only apartment building. It's got a total of ten units, most of them inhabited by single guys like me. Um, she looks at me with those big brown eyes of hers and swallows so hard the damp curls framing her face bounce around. It's raining, I say, as stunned by the downpour as by her unexpected appearance on my doorstep. It is. Are you going to let me in? She's holding a casserole dish out in front of her. It's wrapped in a towel, and the scent of the warm food inside makes my stomach growl. Depends. Does that mean you're planning on feeding me? I point to the dish in her hands. That's the plan, Sherlock. Rose loses her patience and pushes past me. All right then. I shut the door behind her and wrap my arms around my freezing torso. You need a shirt, she says her eyes avoiding my bare midriff. I was about to hop in the shower. I don't want her to think I run around the house half-naked on a regular basis. Go ahead. I'll get dinner ready. Mind if I use the oven to heat this back up a bit? It's better when the cheese is gooey melty. Rose opens my oven before I get a chance to respond. What exactly is it? I ask. A surprise. Go shower. Dinner will be on the table in 15 minutes. Wait. You don't have a table. She spins around, looking at the tiny galley-style kitchen and the lack of a table in the living area. We can eat in front of the TV. I point to the coffee table. That works. Go shower. Her bossiness makes me smile, and I grab a pair of jeans and a nice shirt from my closet before heading to the bathroom to shower. It feels strange knowing she's in my apartment, in my space while I'm standing here, feeling somehow vulnerable as hot water streams down my body. I speed run my shower, towel dry my hair, and put on deodorant before quickly jumping into my clothes. By the time I step back into the small space that's my living area, Rose has served up the food and is carrying two plates over to the couch. You don't happen to have a candle, do you? She asks, and I shake my head. No worries. Hungry? Starving. And not just for food. 
Seeing her in my place looking like a domestic goddess with her wild curls and the tight-fitting sweater she's wearing. I clear my throat. What would you like to drink? What do you have to offer? She asks, her eyes sparkling with mischief and challenge. Water, beer, milk, and apple juice. Juice sounds good. Rose puts the plates down, and I head to the kitchen to pour us each a glass of the apple juice my mom insists on sending home with me every few days along with a gallon of milk. For once, it's coming in handy. She raises an eyebrow when I turn on the TV after handing her a glass. Instead of the candles, I explain, choosing a fireplace video to play in the background. Nice touch. She holds up her juice in salute and takes a sip. Ready to tell me what this is? I ask, eyeing the food on my plate. There's cheese and mashed potatoes and something else and some sort of gravy. Cottage pie, she says like that's supposed to mean anything to me. Ground beef and veggies covered in mashed potatoes and cheese. Try it. I do, and it's delicious. We eat in silence, the only sound the crackling coming from the impromptu fireplace. How was your day at the store? Rose asks, leaning back on the couch. I put down my fork, my initial hunger satisfied. Interesting. Your mom stopped by, and I knocked over an entire display of soup cans. I heard. She grins and takes another sip of juice. We chat about work and horses and our favorite movies while we slowly eat our way through a second helping of food until Rose's phone rings. The shrill noise jolts me out of whatever cozy vibe we've been enjoying. Dad? What's wrong? Rose's expression falls. I can tell the news isn't good. Marigold is foaling. I'm sorry, but I have to run. He needs my help. Rose jumps up and grabs her keys. She's heading straight for the door. Hold on. I follow her and push the front door shut. This will only take a second. I really have to go. Rose's tone is serious, but I doubt a minute one way or the other will make a difference. I know. But not before you give me a chance to thank you for dinner. It's the nicest thing anyone has done for me in a while. My voice is laden with emotion, and I can tell she's picking up on it. I lower my head and raise my hand to cradle hers in my palm. It's warm and soft with all those curls I love so much. She's taken my breath away for years. All that time, I thought she and Max were an item. It wasn't until a few months ago that I learned their relationship was fake. A way to appease both of their families. Now Rose was with me. Except no one knew. And I am growing tired of the deception and the need to sneak kisses. Like this one. My lips brush across hers, and despite the warm temperature at my place, I can feel her shiver. She raises both her arms and wraps them around my neck, pulling me closer. At this point, you can't fit a sheet of paper between us, and that's fine by me. Our lips meet and melt into each other, both of us losing ourselves in the sensation. She's soft and sweet, and I can detect the tiniest hint of apple. Then I stop thinking, and it has nothing to do with the lack of oxygen my brain is surely experiencing as we kiss until we're both breathless and senseless. Gotta go, she says, turns, and is gone. The door clicks shut behind her, and I realize I miss her already. I like having Rose here, at my place. It's the first space that has entirely felt like my own. Out of nowhere, I can't wait to share it with someone again. Not anyone. Her. My Rose. Chapter 7 Rose of course I've read them. Well, one of them. I fell asleep after that. You know how it goes. I'm feeding the horses, phone clamped under my chin. What did it say? Lily asks. I got the call before I even made it out to the barn. I'm surprised my baby sister is awake this early in the morning. Caleb hasn't even made it to the ranch yet, and Dad's sipping his second cup of coffee. Rose, seriously. I'm dying to know what Grandma's letters are about. Are you sure they are just for you? Did she mention me at all? I can practically hear Lily bouncing on the bed with excitement. 
Not so far, but like I said, I've only read the one. What was it about? Seriously Rose, this is like pulling teeth. It was kind of weird, actually. She talked about time running out and that there were some things she needed to share with me. Stuff she wished she'd talked to me about in person, but that it was too late. I wonder when she wrote them, Lily says. It must have been toward the end when she was stuck in that room all day. I didn't go up and see her as much as I should have. Guilt washes over me. It had been hard seeing her so frail, lying in that big bed of hers. You saw her more than I did. And she knew you loved her. What else did she say? I think back, trying to remember the specifics. Most of the letter had been pretty vague. Grandma mentioned that she had some wisdom to share and that there's something about two oaks we don't know anything about. Like what? Lily asks. I'm not sure. That's as far as she got in the first letter. I pictured the struggle it must have been to write during her last days or weeks, or whenever it was that she wrote the letters to me. What do you think she was talking about? Something we don't know about two oaks. I honestly have no idea. Listen, I need to get on with chores before dad comes out here. You know how he gets. You can't leave me hanging. This is like the coolest mystery. I wish I was home. I'd tear through those letters and have the big two oaks mystery figured out in no time flat, Lily says. I shake my head. I'm sure you would. I'll try to remember to do some more reading tonight. Call me the moment you open another letter. Lily's tone takes on another level of urgency. She's really into it. I'm not sure there's a big mystery, and I have things to do. I have to run. Talk to you later, I say when I hear Caleb's truck rumbling down the long drive and hang up. I brush my hair out of my face and look at my worn jeans and the muck boots I'm wearing. I have no doubt there's hay stuck in my hair and probably some splatters of something unmentionable somewhere on my outfit. Despite it all, I have butterflies in my stomach. More so than usual after that kiss last night. It had curled my toes in all the best ways, and I'd relived it a thousand times since then. Good morning. Caleb waves as he walks up, holding the pair of muck boots my mom insisted he keep in one hand. Morning. I smile shyly and don't know what to do with my hands. What I want to do is run up and wrap them around his neck the way I'd done last night. But that isn't an option. Ready to serve up breakfast? Caleb asks, motioning for the barn before kicking off his sneakers and stepping into the boots. All done. We can move right to the brushing and mucking. Following his lead, I keep my tone light and casual. Already? He looks up at the rising sun, sounding surprised. I was up early. Figured I might as well get a head start on the day. As we walk into the dimly lit horse barn, I think back to the first kiss Caleb and I had shared a few months ago. It hadn't lasted nearly as long as our kiss last night because both of us were worried about someone walking out and catching us huddled together in the dark behind the tipsy cow. It was the night we watched my friend Max propose to Maeve, the woman he'd had a crush on for as long as I can remember. The whole town watched the live broadcast of her Oscar nomination from the local watering hole. There'd been music, dancing, and a whole lot of excitement. When Caleb asked me to dance, I thought it was innocent enough, and when I saw the look my dad shot me, I shrugged it off. After all, it had been obvious that Max and I would never be married, no matter how much dad wanted it. Dancing with Caleb had been something else. I still remember what it felt like to be in his arms, to touch in public, and when he'd asked me to go outside for some air, I'd followed gladly. And when he'd asked me if he could kiss me, I'd nodded. The kiss was sweet and short. But the fear of being discovered made it exciting and memorable. I felt like a teenager making out under the bleachers. What's wrong? Caleb asks, his voice pulling me out of my memories. I thought about our first kiss and how ridiculous it is that we're still sneaking around, keeping this secret. Whatever this is. I shrug, keeping my tone light. Caleb's face grows serious. Whatever this is? 
Before I can respond, Dad walks into the barn to check on our progress. Is your dad serious about hiring this Sean guy? Caleb asks when we're walking the fence line at the far end of the property after breakfast. It's a pleasant task after the biscuits and gravy mom fixed today. I love the stuff, but always feel like I need a two-hour nap after I eat it. Almost as bad as Thanksgiving dinner. The fresh air and exercise are doing more than the two cups of coffee I had to revive me. He is. I tried to talk him out of it and I think there's something fishy about the guy, but you know my dad. When he makes up his mind, there's no need to finish the sentence. Caleb nods and grows quiet as we stroll along the pasture. Now and then, he reaches over and pulls on a post, making sure it's firmly in the ground. That doesn't mean he won't keep you on, though. I think he sees how much progress you're making, I say into the heavy silence. Only the birds are chirping in the hedge a few feet away from us. Right. He turns his back to me and pulls on the wire. There's no need. You can see the line is taut from a mile away. No horse is getting out in this stretch of the pasture. Not even Diabolo, our escape artist. Something wrong? I ask, stepping up next to him and putting my hand on his lower back. Nah, just trying to get this done. Ready? He walks away from me, striding quickly down the line. I fall into a slow jog to keep up. By the time we make it back to the barn, I can't shake the feeling that there's definitely something off. You know, you really are doing well. Look at you and Diabolo becoming fast friends, I say, watching him brush my father's favorite horse. A feeling of pride rises in me, looking at Caleb and the fierce stallion. After that vicious kick, he'd gotten right back into the saddle, metaphorically speaking. He didn't show fear, and despite my dad's misgivings, he's getting good at handling the horses. You don't have to do that, he says, his eyes never leaving the horse. Do what? Tell you that you're making progress. It's the truth and part of my job. You're doing great. If I was, your dad wouldn't feel the need to hire someone else, Caleb mutters. He's worried you'll quit with the grocery store and stuff. It's only part of the story, but I don't want to talk about how ridiculously old-fashioned my father is. I won't. I mean, I'll keep working there as long as my family needs me, but it isn't what I want to do the rest of my life. Caleb turns to look at me. I know. Diabolo nudges him between the shoulder blades, annoyed that his spa treatment was interrupted. I had a good time last night, I say in an effort to continue the conversation and figure out what's going on with Caleb. I did too. That casserole thing you made was delicious. Thank you. It's a cottage pie, I say, waiting for him to say something else. At least acknowledge the kiss we shared. Can we not talk about this anymore and enjoy the rest of our day? Caleb asks before returning his attention to the demanding horse. Of course. Wanna go for a ride before your shift at the store? I ask. That'd be great. Let me go check in with mom to see if there's anything she needs me to do before we head out. I walk up to the house, wondering what's really going on with Caleb. Hey, honey, Caleb gone already, she asks. My mom is standing in front of the stove, getting ready to can something. Glass jars are lined up everywhere, and there's steam coming from the large water bath canner. Not yet. I was thinking of taking him out for a quick trail ride. Unless there's something else you or dad need us to do. Nothing I can think of, and your dad didn't mention anything before he left for town. You two have fun. You both work too much. She smiles at me across the table of warm glass jars. Maybe that's his problem, I say under my breath. Of course, she hears every word of it. What's wrong, honey? Wiping her hands on her apron, she steps around the table and comes up to me. It's Caleb. He's in some sort of mood today. I shake my head. Tell me what happened. I recount our walk earlier and our conversation in the barn. Ah. I think I know what's going on. She sounds confident. You do? I ask. 
It's pretty obvious if you think about it. His pride is hurt. He applied for a position to make a good impression, and your father turns around and hires someone else. That's got a sting. I think about my mother's words for a moment. That could be it. Trust me, honey. It's exactly what it is. See what you can do to suit that over, and I'll have another chat with your dad. I appreciate the sentiment, but we both know that he won't change his mind. If you could describe my father in one word, it would be stubborn. By the time I return to the barn, Diabolo is in his stall by himself, happily munching a fresh ration of Timothy Hay. Caleb? I call when I don't see him anywhere. Back here. His voice is soft, barely a whisper, and it's coming from the far end of the barn. I walk up to step into a scene worthy of a Hallmark movie. Caleb is leaning against the side of the large stall that serves as maternity ward and nursery. Marigold is standing protectively over her newborn fowl. His name is Star, I say, walking up beside him. He was born last night. He's the reason you had to rush off? Caleb asks. All I can do is nod when he wraps his arm around my shoulder and pulls me close. Sorry about earlier, Caleb says. I was in a mood. The whole Sean thing? I ask. He nods. Then I realized something. There's nothing I can do about that. What I can do is show your dad how serious I am about this. He motions around the barn. You really are, aren't you? I ask. Of course. I don't want to spend my life in the grocery store. That's my parents' dream, not mine. I want to spend my days outside, away from the crowds, and feel like I've accomplished something by the time my head hits the pillow. I laugh. Running two oaks will definitely do that. And I want to spend my life with you. If that's what you want. He turns to look at me, his beautiful soft eyes staring into mine. I don't know how long we stand there, breathing in sync and staring into each other's soul. I want that too. Chapter 8 Caleb Ready to head out? I ask Patrick after I've done my part to close the store and put the cash in the safe in the office. It's been a good couple of days. Dad will be pleased. Almost. Give me ten to finish restocking eggs and dairy for the morning. Patrick rushes off and I follow behind. Here, let me give you a hand, and we can be out of here in five. I take a stack of egg cartons and refill the refrigerated case. I appreciate it, but if you want to head out, I can lock up, Patrick says, working quickly to restock milk and butter. I don't mind. I was thinking we could grab a beer at the Tipsy Cow after this if you're up for it. I grab a tray of yogurt containers and start restocking. Seriously? Pat glances at me, looking surprised. We haven't been particularly close since we were teenagers and don't spend much time together outside of work and family obligations. Not that there's a ton of time outside of that, anyway. I want to say thanks for having my back with Dad the other day. Besides, I haven't had a chance to be you and darts in a while. What do you say? You've got it. Loser buys another round. Pat puts away the cream in half and half, and we're done. Fifteen minutes later, the two of us walk into the tipsy cow. Linden's one and only watering hole is quiet. Not a big surprise for a Thursday night. What can I get you, gentlemen? Amy, the owner, asks when we walk in the door. Her husband Leo, a writer, raises his hand and waves before returning his attention to the notebook that's never far out of reach. Two coarse lights, and do you mind if we hit the dartboard? Patrick asks. Knock yourself out. Amy reaches down into the cooler under the bar and pulls out two ice-cold bottles. Want me to start you a tab, or is this it for you boys? Tab would be great. Caleb's paying. Patrick grins and saunters off to the table next to the dartboard, beer in hand. I thought we were going to play for it, I call after him. Same difference. He takes a long swig, puts down the bottle, and walks up to the board. He's not wrong. Pat's beat almost everyone in town, Amy says, 
making a note on a small pad of paper. He comes here a lot? I ask Amy. I have no idea what my brother does on his nights off. Couple of times a week. Doesn't stay late or anything, but I'm guessing he has to get out of the house for a bit. Can't be easy living at home at his age. Don't project, sweetheart. Just because you had a hard time moving back home doesn't mean he feels the same way. Besides, Pat could rent a place like Caleb did if he wanted to. Leo walks behind the bar and pours himself a cup of coffee. Are you coming, or are you too busy gossiping over there? Patrick calls across the room, two sets of darts in hand. I'm coming. Hold your horses. I shake my head at his impatience and join him in front of the dartboard. Want to go first or second? Pat asks, handing me a set of darts. Most points in one draw goes second. I know I'm in trouble when he easily beats the 25 points I rack up with a lucky throw. Half an hour later, I owe Pat two more beers. Amy wasn't kidding. You are good. I had no idea. I take a seat, needing a break after the humiliation of getting beaten like that twice in a row. Sure you're not up for another round? We could work out some sort of handicap to make it a little more even. Pat takes the seat across from me. Don't do it, Amy calls from behind the bar, her eyes blazing with excitement. She enjoyed watching Pat wipe the floor with me. Maybe another night. After I had a couple hundred hours of practice. I should get a board for my place. I don't think my neighbors would mind. They are a noisy bunch who throw parties and play loud music all hours of the night. It makes getting up before five a challenge. Maybe it's time for a little payback. Suit yourself. I guess we better head home. Don't you have to get up early to pick up a bunch of horse dung or something? Pat asks. I laugh and shake my head. I can hang around a bit longer. Besides, I owe you another beer. I raise my hand and motion for Amy to bring us another round. Beer for Pat and Coke for me. I switch to soda after the first one. The caffeine and sugar would keep me up longer than they should, but it was nice hanging out with my brother. If you're up for it. Pat leans back in his chair and kicks his boots up on a second one. Like I said, it's the least I could do. By the way, what was that about the other day? You don't usually take my side when it comes to dad or the store. What do you mean? I always have your back. Patrick doesn't sound like he's convincing anyone, including himself. Right. Seriously, is there a reason you spoke up for me working on the ranch? I've been racking my brain, and I can't come up with anything. I want you to be happy, that's all. From what I can tell, you enjoy your time there. I'm sure it's got something to do with the pretty Rose Baker. Where is she, by the way? I figured she'd meet us here. Here you go. A beer and a soda. Let me know if there's anything else I can get you. Amy puts the drinks down in front of us. Thanks, Amy. I turn back to face my brother. Why would Rose be here? Because the two of you are dating. Isn't that the kind of thing couples do? Patrick asks, acting as if he hadn't gone out with half the town's daughters. We're not dating. We work together. That's all. Amy tries to hide a cough. Patrick isn't so polite. He laughs in my face. Right. Like anyone's buying that. We're friends, that's all, I say as Amy walks back behind the bar. I hope word about this doesn't get around to her family. Her dad's giving her a hard enough time as is, and there's no way I can win him over to my side if he thinks I'm with his daughter behind his back. I appreciate the help, son. My dad puts the ladder up against the side of the store. We closed less than half an hour ago, and there was just enough sunlight left for the job. Like I said, it's no problem. Happy to help. I watch him scramble up, carrying a can of brick red paint. Leaning a second ladder on the front of the old brick building, I climb up myself, paintbrushes tucked into my back pocket and a can of white paint in hand. Shouldn't take us long to repaint the sign. Dad adjusts his tools and pops open the can, dipping his brush in. 
He colors over the fading letters that read Linden Grocers. I never asked you, but how come you didn't change the name when you bought the store? I had been too young to care when we moved to this small one-stoplight town in upstate South Carolina. What else would I have called it, my dad asks, looking confused. I don't know. Something like Montgomery and Sons. I guess I figured you'd want to make the place your own. My father laughs. And you think I haven't? Not really, I say truthfully. The place looks almost exactly like it had in the 50s. At least from the pictures I've seen. Don't let facades and signs fool you. Your mother and I made it our own and turned this grocery store into something that'll last for generations. Why not modernize the sign, then? I could draw up a new logo if you'd like. Painting and sketching have been a hobby of mine since middle school. I guess it's part of why I like it so much at Two Oaks. The place is inspiring and despite working what amounts to two full-time jobs, I've made a few sketches, and one of these days, I'm going to get my supplies out and sit down to paint the two ancient oak trees that gave Rose's place its name. I doubt that would go over well. People like the name and the sign. And to be honest, so do I. Dad leans back to inspect his work. Watch yourself. We're pretty high up. I keep an eye on him while we paint. Isn't that supposed to be my line? Dad asks, smiling at me. I'm not sure you've noticed, but Pat and I are grown men. I dip the brush back into the paint and continue going over the old lettering. There's no telling how many coats of paint this old sign has at this point, but it's more than a handful. Trust me, I've noticed. You two have come a long way since we moved here. Do you remember marking your height in the back of the stockroom? He asks. Not the first few times. I'd been too young when we moved here. But the tradition continued until we got to middle school and refused to be measured anymore. Nine times out of ten, Pat had beat me by a fraction of an inch. Which irked me, considering I was the older of us. Even if it was by less than fifteen minutes. He's in Greenville, visiting friends, Dad says out of the blue. Patrick? I asked to make sure I hadn't missed anything. Yes. Do you know who he's hanging out with these days? Dad sounds worried. Not really. Amy said he's been playing darts a lot at the bar. Why do you ask? I know the answer before the words come out of his mouth. Your mother and I are worried he'll fall in with a bad crowd again. You know what they said. It's easy for him to relapse if he's around that stuff again. The stuff was drugs, and not the recreational kind. Pat had gotten himself in quite a bit of trouble right out of high school. He's been clean for years, Dad. You know as well as I do that doesn't mean much. He could go back to doing that stuff any time. And he's been broody lately. He's right. Pat has been acting strange for the past few months. Coming to my defense in this store was out of character, and that was a warning sign from everything I'd read. Keep an eye on him for me, will you? Maybe spend a little more time with your brother, meet his friends, that kind of thing. I'll see what I can do. It's not like I have a ton of free time to hang out. But he's my brother, and Dad has a point. Thanks, son. I think we're about ready to switch. Dad climbs down the ladder, and I follow suit. I'm a bit higher when I hear him gasp. I turn around in time to see him hit the ground with a loud thud. He yelps, and I know something's wrong as the red paint flows across him. I scramble down as fast as I can and crouch down beside him. Don't move. Pulling my phone from my pocket, I'm ready to call an ambulance. Don't you dare. We're not going to make a fuss. Give me a second to get my breath back. Dad grabs my arm, and despite my best efforts to keep him from moving, he sits up. You can have a broken back, I say. He shakes his head. I'm pretty sure I'd notice if I did. Help me up. I don't think that's a good idea. At least let me call Dr. Thompson. The old man has been taking care of our family and any other Linden resident for as long as I can remember. I don't need no doctor. He scrambles up, and I give him a hand. It's not like I have any options here. Sure, 
I could have wrestled him back to the ground, but if there was something wrong with his back, it would cause more damage than what he's doing now. Carl, what happened? Mom comes running up from the small house I grew up in that sits behind the store. An apron is tied around her waist, the tails flapping in the breeze as she runs up. I slipped and missed a couple of rungs on the ladder, he says, pulling himself up to his full height. It was more than a couple. I'm taking you to the hospital, my mother says, giving dad her don't mess with me look. It doesn't come out often, but when it does, you better watch out. I'm not going to the hospital. I'm fine. The grimace on his face as he takes a couple of steps exposes the lie for both of us to see. Fine. Be stubborn then. But we're going to go see Dr. Thompson. Caleb, help your father to his truck. Passenger side. Mom rushes back to the house and returns a moment later, the apron exchanged for her purse. She's on her phone. We can't leave the store looking like this, Dad says. It's taken a few minutes to walk the short distance to his F-150. His is newer than my own truck and has quite a bit more horsepower. I'll finish up while you go see the doc. Take it easy, old man. We need you around here. He barks out a laugh, pressing a hand to his side. Dr. Thompson will meet us at the clinic, Mom says, shoving her phone into her purse and unlocking the truck. I watch them take off after helping my father in the cab. I can tell he's in more pain than he's letting on, and that has me worried. Might as well get this cleaned up, I say to myself, looking at the puddle of red paint on the concrete pad in front of the store. Chapter 9 Rose When I pull up to the grocery store, Caleb is standing on a tall ladder, repainting the sign. Hey, what are you doing up there? What does it look like? He calls back while I'm busy berating myself for the words that flew out of my mouth before I had a chance to censor them. Ask a stupid question, get a stupid answer. Looks to me like you're painting the sign, I say. I mean, what else could you say in this situation? You've got it. He turns and gives me this adorable grin of his before climbing down. You didn't have to stop on my account. I'm just popping in to pick up some laundry detergent. Mom asked me to wash the sheets and give Grandma's old room a good airing out before the new guy shows up on Monday. She and Dad left for the day to look at a horse somewhere in North Carolina. Of course, she forgot to mention that we were completely out of detergent, making my list of chores for the day even longer. We're closed, Caleb says, wiping his fingers on his jeans. They were covered in splotches and splatters of paint. Not just the red and white of the sign, either. Seriously? On a Saturday? I ask. Not that I do a lot of shopping. One of the perks of living at home. Always have. We're open until noon and then close up for the rest of the weekend. Shoot. That's gonna make it hard to wash those sheets. I wonder if there's something you can substitute. Shampoo maybe? Or the soft soap from the bathroom? Tell you what. Give me a few minutes to finish painting, and I'll open it up for you. What do you need, he asks, already climbing back up, paintbrush and can in hand. Don't laugh. Laundry detergent and flour tortillas. Interesting combo. He dips the brush in the red paint and gets back to work looking like he knows what he's doing. I don't know what it is, but somehow his brush strokes look experienced. Like something he's done a million times. There's no hesitation, and from what I can tell from down here, not a splash or stroke goes out of the lines of the old logo. What's the plan? Laundry and burritos, he calls back to me. Almost. Washing sheets and making quesadillas. I'm on my own for the day, and I hate to break it to you, but I'm not much of a cook. Good to know. Could have fooled me with that cottage pie the other night. My one and only respectable dish. Grandma Iris made sure Lily, and I could make it from the time we were old enough to be trusted in the kitchen, I say, leaning against the hood of my car, enjoying the view in front of me. He looked good and well-worn, paint-splattered jeans and his position up on the ladder gave me a good view of his backside. 
How old was that, he asks. Depends. Lily was nine. I was fifteen. He laughs, and for a split second, I think the brush might slip, but he's quick to recover. Not the domestic type. Noted. Not at all. I'd much rather muck out stalls, than cook. You're pretty good at this, by the way, I add, in an obvious attempt to change the subject. You should see my other work. Like what? I try to remember any other buildings that have been painted recently and come up blank. Maybe he had a different side gig before he started working at Two Oaks. I'll show you sometime. Caleb paints over the last bit of faded red and heads down. A man of mystery, I tease, helping him gather the paint supplies and noticing a faint stain of red on the concrete pad in front of the entrance. Something like that. Don't worry, that's paint, he says, following the direction of my gaze. We set the ladders and supplies by the side of the store facing the house his family lives in. Shouldn't we wash these or something? I ask. Caleb shakes his head. It'll take paint thinner to clean those. I'll take them back to my place in a bit. He pulls a large ring of keys from his front pocket and walks to the front door. I appreciate this, I say, when he unlocks the glass door and holds it open for me. My pleasure. We walk through the store to the aisle in the back that's well stocked with various cleaning supplies. For a small grocery store, Linden's Grocers has a pretty good selection of stuff. This place is like a TARDIS, I say. That's Doctor. Who, right? he asks, looking at me confused. Bigger on the inside. The blank stare continues. Please tell me you've watched Doctor Who. He shakes his head. Not much time for TV. Not even as a teenager? I ask. I was glued to the screen whenever I wasn't writing. I had other interests, he says. The mystery deepens. I see a bottle I'm pretty sure is the brand my mother uses and grab it. I'm all set. Don't you need flour tortillas? Caleb asks. As a matter of fact, I do. You're not just good at painting and dealing with Diabolo's temper tantrums. You're pretty good at this too, I say. I mean it. He's come a long way and has gotten almost as good as my dad at getting the temperamental stallion to play along when it came to daily chores. Not something everyone managed, present company included. Right. Caleb turns and walks over to the small bakery department, leaving me wondering what I've said. Right. Tortillas, to make quesadillas. I quicken my steps to catch up with him. What size, he asks, motioning for the display. The bigger the better, I say with a grin, and my stomach grumbles. Caleb returns the smile. Something catches his eye, and he moves past me to pull something from the self behind me. For you. On the house. It's a single cupcake in a plastic container, covered in frosting, that makes my mouth water. Salted caramel, my favorite. I know. He looks pleased. How? It's what you picked for your birthday our freshman year, he says like it's nothing. And you remember that? From back then? That's been, I don't really want to know how many years it's been. Rose Baker, I've been carrying a torch for you for a pretty long time, Caleb says. Then he walks off to the cash register and acts like he didn't just make what pretty much amounts to a declaration of love. Before I can come up with something to say, the door opens, and Mrs. Clark sticks her head in. Are you open? I opened up for Rose to grab a few things. Is there something you need? Caleb asks in his best customer service voice. If you don't mind. I was driving over to see if your mama would let me borrow a bag of flour. I know she keeps a few extra things in her pantry for emergencies. I didn't realize I'd run out. I promise to bring biscuits and muffins to church tomorrow morning. Mrs. Clark's cheeks turned the slightest bit pink, like running out of flour was something to be embarrassed about. I guess around Linden it would be. Go ahead and grab what you need while I ring up Rose, Caleb says, and the woman basically sprints to the far corner of the store. 
This is really sweet of you, I say when he hands the cupcakes back to me. Anytime. Mrs. Clark is back before we get a chance to talk more. I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. If the ladies at church had found out, Mrs. Clark shakes her head, confirming my suspicions. Don't worry, I say. Your secret's safe with me. Are you sure this isn't an excuse to get me back to your place? I ask when I get out of my car, having followed Caleb's truck across town to his apartment building. Now that you mention it, his eyes grow smoldering before he turns to pick up the cans of paints and stack of brushes he'd stashed on a bit of tarp in the back of his truck. Hmm. I follow up upstairs, memories of our kiss the other night flashing through my mind. Let me get these soaking, and I'll show you what I was talking about. Caleb ducks into a hall closet and comes back with a can of paint thinner and an old glass jar. I put the cupcakes I'd carried upstairs on the kitchen counter and look around for plates or a couple of paper towels. Top cabinet to the right of the coffee maker. Forks are in the drawer over there. Caleb motions to the right of the sink before carefully pouring paint thinner into the jar and swirling the brushes around in it. Thanks. I hand him a plate with a cupcake and a ridiculously large fork before grabbing the same for myself. You were showing me something? Not with that in your hand, he says, pointing to my cupcake. I quickly sit it down and wipe my hands on my jeans. All clean, see. I hold my hands out in front of him like I'm five and he laughs. All right. Art before food. He puts his own plate down and walks into the living room. Art? You'll see. His coffee table turns out to be a large wooden crate with a lid that lifts off. Inside are canvases in several sizes and an impressive array of paints from watercolor to acrylic and oil. You paint? I ask, totally stunned. Didn't you just watch me do that, he asks, looking amused as he pulls a few pieces from the crate to show me. I saw you paint over a sign. This is, something else. I study the collection of finished and partially finished pieces lined up in front of me. It's a fun hobby. Caleb studies my face carefully. It's a lot more than that, isn't it? These are, really good, I finish, struggling to come up with words that reflect the emotions the images evoke in me. Most of them are landscapes. Scenes from in and around town. They don't just capture the look of the places. His paintings capture the heart and soul of his subject matter, whether it's an old barn about to fall in on itself, or the portrait of an elderly woman I don't recognize. I wonder if it's his grandmother. I'm glad you like them. More than like. Thank you for sharing them with me. I realize how rare it must be for him to show these to someone. If anyone else in Linden had seen them, word would have gotten out all over town that we have an aspiring artist in our midst. Before he can respond, his phone rings. I'm sorry, I have to take this. I walk into the kitchen and pick up my cupcake to give him as much privacy as I can in the small place. What did they say? he says, sounding concerned. There's a long bit of silence. I guess that's good news, all things considered. Where are you now? Try as I might, I can't stop listening to his part of the conversation, running scenarios through my head of what could be going on that had him so worried. He'd seemed fine earlier. Of course. I'll be right over. He hangs up and joins me in the kitchen. You have to go? I ask in an echo of his question the other night. I do. My dad fell off the ladder earlier. Mom took him to the doctor. He has a couple of cracked ribs. They are home now, and dad wants to talk to me. Go. Take care of your family. I take one last look at the paintings he'd shown me and shove a bite of cupcake into my mouth before we both head outside. On the drive home to Two Oaks, I think about what I've learned about Caleb Montgomery today. There's a whole side to the man I knew nothing about. Today he gave me a glimpse of it, and I need some time to figure out what that means. For me. For him. For us. Chapter 10 Caleb 
How is he? I ask the moment I walk in the door. Resting. The drive took a lot out of him. At least it's nothing too serious. Mom sitting at the kitchen table, her hands wrapped around a cup of coffee. She has dark circles around her eyes, and the lines on her forehead are deeper than usual. He'll be okay. You know dad. He's as strong as an ox. I take the seat across from her and reach over, putting my hand on her forearm. She lets go of the coffee and takes my hand in both of hers. They are warm to the touch. And just as stubborn. The next few weeks aren't going to be easy. How bad is it? Patrick asks, rushing into the door. His face is white, his eyes dark and wide. Thankfully, all I see in them is worry. None of the telltale signs that he's been using again. He's fine. Everything's fine. There are some logistics we need to figure out. Mom gets up and pours both of us a cup of coffee. And we need to convince Dad to stay home, preferably in bed for a little while, I add, catching my brother up. Oof. That ain't going to be easy, but I think there are some chains in the back of Dad's truck. Patrick grins and moves out of the way just in time before Mom can whack him with the dish towel. You're not helping. She shakes her head, but her eyes are a little brighter than they were a while ago. Is that the boys? Our father's voice booms from upstairs. Tell them to come up. We're all coming. Mom sighs and motions for us to follow her upstairs. We make for a strange sight. The three of us congregated around my parents' king-sized bed. It fills the better part of the bedroom, leaving barely enough room for us to stand around. Mom sits down on the bed next to Dad, taking his hand and keeping him from sitting up. I can see him wincing at the small motion and for the first time, I realize how serious this is. Not in a life-threatening kind of way, but in a turning my life upside down one. We need to talk about the store. Obviously, our current arrangement won't work. At least not for the next few days. Weeks. Dr. Thompson wants you home for at least two weeks. And after that, only light duty. And don't even think about lifting anything heavier than my toothbrush. I heard the man. I still think the notion is ridiculous. He uses her hand to pull himself up into a sitting position. He's gasping for air, and his face has gone whiter than Patrick's was when he walked in the door. You really shouldn't. He holds up a hand and stares at Mom. All she can do is shake her head, and I'm pretty sure she's rolling her eyes. Here's what I'm thinking. Caleb, you open up in the morning. Patrick, you work the late shift. Your mother will help you close. I know it won't be easy, but it'll only be for a few days, and I'll see if I can hire someone to help out while I'm out of commission. There's got to be some high school student looking for a little extra spending money. It takes him a while to get all the words out, pausing to catch his breath frequently. None of us dare to interrupt, no matter how much we're itching to do so. I can practically feel Patrick vibrating next to me. I can close on my own. Plus, you're going to need mom here. I'm assuming walking up and down these stairs is out of the question for a while? Don't be ridiculous. I'm a grown man. On bed rest. I'll be going back and forth, and you'll have your phone right here on the night table. Anything you need, you call me, and I'll be right over, Mom says, pointing to my dad's old flip phone. He was one of the few people I knew who actually used the device to make phone calls. And I can open instead, since Caleb has his job at Two Oaks, Patrick says a moment later. Out of the question. He's right. Pat. I have to open and deal with orders, suppliers, and all the million other details I'd picked up along the way to make sure the store was running smoothly. Dad has been grooming me to be his successor for years, and no matter how much I fight it, right now that's the role my family needs me to step into. Even if it's only temporary. Are you sure? My brother asks, and I can't shake the feeling that there's more to all this than I realize. I nod. I'm sorry. Caleb. I'm sure Mr. Baker will understand. My mother's eyes are warm and full of compassion. I'm starting to think she gets how important my time on the ranch is. 
even if I don't share her sense of optimism. That's settled then. Caleb opens, Patrick closes, and you, my dear, fill in wherever you're needed. And take care of you. When she bends down to kiss our dad, Pat, and I can't wait to get out of there fast enough. Mr. Baker, could I have a word? I walk up to Rose's father dressed in my best suit, okay, my only suit, after church on Sunday. The preacher walks to talk to my mother. How's your husband? I hope it is nothing too serious. He'll live, but I'm sure he'd appreciate a visit from you, Reverend. My mother leads the man of the cloth away from where Rose and her parents are standing. Of course, Mr. Baker says. Mrs. Baker asks in the same breath. How is your father? Rose mentioned he fell and got hurt. Two cracked ribs. He's at home resting. That's what I wanted to talk to you about. I turn to face Rose's father, preparing myself for what I'm sure will be an unpleasant conversation. One that could cost me my position at Two Oaks. I was, after all, still there on a trial basis. Cracked ribs? That's no fun. I bet your dad's in a lot of pain. Mr. Baker shakes his head, and there's genuine concern in his voice that surprises me. Is there anything you need? I'll bring over some food, Mrs. Baker adds. We're fine, but thank you. I'm sure my mom appreciates the sentiment. And she'd be horrified if I didn't turn down the kind offer. He's not going to be able to move around for quite some time. Mr. Baker ignores the casserole talk. That's what I wanted to talk to you about, sir. I give the man my full attention and dive in. They'll need me at the store for a while. I know this is bad timing. Mr. Baker puts a hand on my shoulder. Of course they'll need you to run the store. I understand. That doesn't mean I'm any less committed to learning everything I can about raising horses and running a property like yours. I'd very much like to come back to work for you, but right now, my family needs me. And I respect that, Caleb. You have an obligation to them, and right now, that needs to come first. Tell you what, come back whenever you're ready. My door is open. He turns, and taking his wife's arm, he leaves with her. I'm left to stare at Rose. I don't know what to say. This is not how I'd expected this conversation to go. Rose smiles and gives me a thumbs up. I think he's starting to warm up to you. When her father calls, Rose turns. I'll be right there. You've got to go, I say. I do. He's my ride, Rose says. We've got to stop doing that. One of us is always rushing off because something's happening with our families, she mutters. It's fine. You heard your dad. I can come back as soon as Dad's back on his feet. I still can't quite wrap my head around that. I heard of ranch hands being fired for missing a day or two. Chores don't wait and animals need to be taken care of no matter what happens in the rest of your life. I told you he's pretty impressed with how far you've come. Call me later. I want to hear more about those paintings of yours. I will. Maybe I can come out and paint the old barn or the oaks that frame the drive, I say. I'd like that. Rose blows me a quick kiss and strides off to catch up with her parents. I turn to look for my mother, who's still deep in conversation with the good reverend. I stroll toward them, still trying to process everything that's happened in the last few minutes. Chapter 11 Rose Rose, I want you to meet Sean Perkins, Dad says when I walk into the kitchen after morning chores. The guy in front of me looks like he'd be an actor from one of those young adult TV shows. Tall, dark, handsome, and boy, does he know it. I can feel the self-confidence rolling off of him in waves as he stands up and holds out his hand. It's nice to meet you. I hear we're going to work closely together. He gives me a brilliant smile that feels a little too big to be genuine. Likewise. I may be a little biased, but Two Oaks is a great place. You'll enjoy working here, I say to dispel the tension between us. Sure seems that way. Your mom's making me feel very welcome. Sean points to the large plate of bacon and eggs in front of him, making me laugh. 
You won't go hungry around here, my father says, sounding pleased, and mom is beaming with pride. I take a seat, and she hands me a plate as well. I enjoy my eggs and listen to dad give Sean a rundown of what's going on at Two Oaks. Rose can take you to the stables after you get settled in. If you don't mind jumping right in, you can help brush and muck, he says. I don't mind at all. Give me a couple of minutes to get my bags upstairs and change into boots. Sean gets up and takes his cup and plate to the sink, earning himself more brownie points with my mom. Rose can help you with that. You don't mind, honey, do you? My dad asks. Not at all. I passed three bags and a backpack on my way to the kitchen when I walked in. We've met, Sean says as we walk up the stairs. You probably don't remember. It was a long time ago, at a rodeo, in Clemson. You won the barrel race. I don't, I say. I haven't entered a competition in ages. Not since starting high school, and the win at Clemson was a couple of years before I quit. You were something else on that horse of yours. He shakes his head and throws his bags on the bed that used to be Grandma Iris's. This is nice. I look around the room. It's larger than mine and looks different than when my grandmother stayed here. You have a good view of the back pasture. I think I'm going to like it here. Give me a minute to put on my boots, and we can head out. Take your time. I'll meet you downstairs. What do you think? Dad asks when I step back into the kitchen. Hard to tell. Let's see how he does with the horses. I still had my doubts about the man. Seeing how Buttercup reacts to him would tell me a lot. She's the best judge of character I know, aside from Marybell, our cat, who's been suspiciously absent this morning. He's very good-looking, my mother says, earning her a sideways glance from my dad that makes me laugh. When Sean joins us, we head out to the barn. Everyone's been fed and watered, but the stalls need mucking and a few of the maras could use a good brushing. This right here is the heart of our operation. Dad struts around the stable, pointing various details out to Sean. He seems impressed. And this must be your prize stallion. I've heard about you, Diabolo. Sean steps up to the horse and gives him a chance to smell and get to know him. He's good, I whisper to my dad, watching the two of them interact. Sean is gentle with just the right amount of firmness. Diabolo seems to take an instant liking to him. You don't like having your mane touched, do you? Sean says in a soothing voice. We'll have to work on that. Can't have you running around looking like this. I think this was a good call, my dad says to me when my phone starts to buzz in my back pocket. I look at the screen. Caleb started a video chat. There is no way I'm answering that out here with these two men staring at me intently. I decline the call and shove the phone back. As we make our way to the end of the barn where Marigold and Star are staying, it buzzes again. I do my best to ignore it. Aren't you a handsome little guy? Sean inspects Star carefully. He's only a few days old but already showing a promise to replace his sire one day. I lean against the side of the stall, and when my phone vibrates with another alert, the motion is audible against the wooden wall. Boyfriend? Sean asks, and my dad snorts. I pull my phone out, finding three different text messages from Caleb. It's Caleb, our other ranch hand, I say, since I can't exactly fess up to dating the man in front of my dad. Not until he and I have a conversation about it. Caleb is taking a couple of weeks off to help out with family. The timing worked out perfect with you coming in today. Thanks for showing up so quickly. By the way, Dad says. Not a problem. I didn't have anything else going on, and to be honest, I'm looking forward to learning more about your operation here. Two Oaks has quite the reputation for quality horses. I can see why. Sean looks around, seeming impressed. I can see that it earns him brownie points with Dad. I'm not quite sold though. I'll let the two of you get to work. I have some paperwork to catch up on. Dad waves and leaves. Where do you want me to start? 
Sean asks, tearing himself away from mother and full. Why don't you start with Diabolo Stahl, and I'll work on this one, I say. Throwing me to the devil already, he asks with a grin that tells me he doesn't actually mind. Something like it. Gotta make sure you're up to working here. I hand him a hayfork and point him in the direction of the wheelbarrow. Dung pile is out that door and to your left, down the hill. I, I, Captain. He saunters off. He's something else, isn't it? I ask Marigold. She snorts, shakes her head, and leans down to check on her baby. We make good progress, working our way through the barn, mucking one stall after the other. He's faster than Caleb, I'll give him that. But he's also a terrible flirt, especially without my dad around. Maybe I should have told him Caleb and I were seeing each other. I shake my head at myself, acting like a teenager. Shifting gears, I keep the banter light but put him in his place. There's a diner on Main Street that's pretty good. Head back into town and go a block past the light. You can't miss it, I say when he asks me out to lunch. Plan on meeting me there, he asks. I laugh and shake my head, curls bouncing everywhere as usual. I'm going to grab a sandwich here. Some of us still have work to do. Message received. No lunch date. But I hope we can become friends. Would be awkward if we didn't work together like this. He winks and walks over to Buttercup stall. My horse looks confused when someone other than me enters to muck it. I stand back and watch to see the two of them interact. How was your first day? Mom asks when Sean joins us at the dinner table that evening. It was good. You have some impressive stock and a beautiful property. Sean's hair is damp from his shower, and he'd changed into clean jeans and a tight-fitting black t-shirt. It's all I can do not to roll my eyes at the obvious attempt to show off his toned torso. I'm sure your folks' place is just as nice, Dad says. Close, but this is different. Something about the rolling landscape and the air around here. Sean fills his plate with meatloaf and mashed potatoes, and I start to wonder if I should have taken him to the diner for lunch after all. The chicken salad sandwiches we had for lunch must not have been enough to fill him up. Why don't you take Sean to the tipsy cow after dinner and introduce him to some of the folks around town? Mom says. Tipsy cow? Sean asks me, looking interested. The local bar, my father explains. I think that's a great idea. By the man a beer, Rose. Hey, how was your day? I ask Caleb, holding my phone to my ear while digging around my closet for something semi-clean to wear to the bar. Uneventful. The regular Monday grocery rush, but that was about it. I'm glad you finally called me back though. Caleb sounds tired. Where are you now? My parents' house. I promised mom to keep dad company until she and Patrick close up. I'm making pasta. You're in charge of dinner? Maybe you should take my mom up on the offer to bring over some meals. I'll ask her to whip something up so you can reheat it tomorrow. I look at a dark navy button down that'll have to do and throw it on the bed. You don't have to do that. I hear banging and then a yelp. Trust me, it'll make her day. What did you do? Draining pasta. Some got on my hands. Water runs in the background. I'm fine. How about your dad? How's he holding up? I ask. He's in enough pain to stay put. Grumpy as all get out, though. I'm hoping this pasta will soften him up a little. How was your day? New guy working out okay? Caleb asks. I kick the door to my room closed, aware that Sean is just down the hall and could walk past at any moment. He's all moved in and getting the lay of the land. So far, he's doing well. He even gets along with Diabolo. Hmm. He grew up with horses. Don't read anything into it. Listen, I have to go. Catch up tomorrow? I say when I hear a soft knock on my door. Sounds good. I'll try to swing by for a bit if that's okay. I'd love that. 
I end the call and quickly change shirts. Be there in a minute, I call out to Sean, opening the door back up. Take your time. He's leaning against the wall of the hallway, feet crossed. That arrogant smile is out in full force again. I brush through my hair and put on a touch of lip gloss before grabbing my phone and keys. Let's do this, I say and race down the stairs. Taking Sean out for a beer feels like a chore, an obligation, and I want to get this over with as quickly as I can. Do you come here a lot? Sean asks when I pull into the parking lot of the tipsy cow. Not really. I appreciate the company then. He holds the door open for me and steps in behind me. Amy, this is Sean Perkins. My dad hired him and asked me to show him around town. It's nice to meet you, Sean. I run this place with my husband. Leo, come say hi. Amy motions for him to join us. Have you heard anything from Max and Maeve? I ask. I haven't heard much from my friend since he's become de facto manager of Amy's best friend. Mays our town celebrity, Amy explains before turning back to me. Not much. They are both so busy. But the wedding is still on, and it's going to be a big deal. Bigger than yours? I tease. The whole town had come together when Amy and Leo tied the knot last year. Oh, definitely. And there's going to be a second reception, somewhere in Savannah, for all the movie folks. You're not talking about Maeve Alden, are you? Sean asks, taking a seat at the bar. The one and only. What can I get you? Amy asks. Two beers. Do you have a preference? I turn to Sean. Budweiser, if you have it, he says. What kind of question is that? Coming right up. Leo reaches behind the bar and pulls out four bottles. I didn't realize Maeve Alden was from Linden. Sean shakes his head in disbelief. I can top that, I say, getting his full attention. She's marrying my best friend. Rose and Max dated for years. They were high school sweethearts, Amy adds. And then Maeve snatched him away from you? Sean asks, his eyes on me. Something like that. I walk over to the jukebox, not willing to go into the whole story of how Max and I pretended to date for years. It served us both, and we had a lot of fun hanging out together, but it wasn't something I wanted to share with someone who was basically a stranger. So this wedding is going to be a big deal, eh? Sean asks, handing me a quarter when I dig around my pockets and come up empty. Thanks. It is. In case you didn't notice, there isn't a lot going on in this town. Weddings are the highlight of the year. I chose an upbeat song by Luke Bryan. Dance? Sean asks, holding out his hand. I shake my head. I don't think so. Wanna play some darts? Maybe later, Sean says, glancing at the board before walking back to the bar. We chat with Amy and Leo for a while about anything and everything and of course, all the details we have about Max and Maeve's upcoming nuptials. I heard a rumor that Maeve had this whole thing planned down to AT for years, I say to Amy. She grins. I can neither confirm nor deny that there's a thick folder full of dresses, tiaras, and table favors. I've seen it. That thing is huge, Leo says, earning him an elbow to the ribs from his wife. She brought it out for our wedding. They sound like quite the couple. Sean finishes his beer and puts the empty bottle on the counter. Next round's on me. I'm good. I hold up my bottle. It's still three quarters of the way full. Next one then. He takes another Budweiser from Amy and slides a $10 bill her way. It's water for me after this. I have to drive and get up early for chores tomorrow morning. So does he, but I keep my mouth shut. Sean's enjoying himself, and if he works out on the ranch, I want him to enjoy his time in Linden. The door opens, and Caleb's twin, Patrick, walks in. Hi, Rose. He walks up to the bar and orders a bourbon, neat. Patrick, this is Sean Perkins. He's working at Two Oaks for a bit. 
hopefully, it'll be for quite some time. I'm liking the place, Sean says, shaking Patrick's hand. The two of them exchange pleasantries and talk about the rain we desperately need while Amy and I chit-chat about the bridal shower we want to throw for May the day before the wedding. Isn't that cutting it a little close? Patrick asks, joining the conversation. It is, but Maeve can't take time off any sooner than that. They won't wrap filming. Let's hope they don't run past schedule, or she'll miss her own wedding, Amy says. There's no way that's going to happen. She'll make them wait until after their honeymoon if it comes to that, Leo says, with so much confidence I believe him. Besides, he worked in the industry himself back when he and Amy met. The wedding is all they are going to talk about the rest of the night. Up for a game of darts? Patrick asks Sean. Amy opens her mouth to warn Sean that Patrick is a bit of a hustler when it comes to darts, but I shake my head to stop her. Our new ranch hand has a little too much self-confidence for my liking. He could use being taken down a notch by Caleb's brother. This is going to be interesting, Leo says, taking the seat next to me at the bar. Our vantage point gives us a good view of the board and the two men standing in front of it. We should have warned him, Amy mutters, whipping the bar top with a cloth when Sean loses his first round. The two men keep playing long enough for me to finish my beer and switch to sparkling water with lime. As far as I can tell, Sean keeps losing. This guy is good, he says when the two of them rejoin us. You're taking it pretty well, I say, surprised by his attitude. Believe me, it stings, but I know when I'm outmatched. Sean takes a seat and orders another round for him and Patrick. The bar is getting crowded, and the dartboard is popular with the under-45 crowd. Someone walks up to the jukebox and picks another favorite of mine, Suds in the Bucket by Sarah Evans. Ready for that dance? Sean asks. I'm good. I glance at the clock behind the bar. We should probably head back when you're done with your beer. You've been tapping your feet to the music all night. One dance, and we'll head back to the house. I take a sip of my water and consider his outstretched hand. What the heck, I say, and let him pull me up and out to the dance floor. Chapter 12 Caleb I pull up to the parking lot of the tipsy cow and look at the text my brother sent me half an hour ago. Patrick, at the bar. You better come over here now. Nothing else. One line and no response to my text asking what's going on. I pull the door open. The space inside is dimly lit. Upbeat country music blares from the jukebox in the corner. The first person I see is my brother. He's standing by the dartboard, talking to Lex Clark, a farmer a couple of years older than we are. Pat, I call, and he raises his hand. That's when I see her. Rose is twirling around the dance floor with some guy I don't recognize. The guy is at least six foot tall and built like a football player. Wide shoulders and long arms that wrap a little too tightly around my girlfriend. If that's what she is. I guess Rose and I never actually talked about where we stood. I'd assumed we were exclusive, but maybe I'm wrong, considering she's doing the two-step with some stranger in a bar. Hi there, stranger. If you keep this up, you might become one of my regulars. What can I get you? Coors Light? Amy asks, walking past me to deliver a pitcher and four glasses to a table in the back. Coors works, I say, stepping up to the bar when she returns. Amy grabs a glass and fills it. I didn't know you had Coors on tap, I say. A few days ago, when I was here with Pat, she'd opened a bottle. We were out. Bunch of the old-timers like it, so it's usually on tap. Great. I'm drinking old guy beer. That's not going to help me win Rose over. My eyes keep wandering over to the makeshift dance floor where Rose and whoever he is are cutting it up. She's laughing. Her curls are bouncing around, and Rose looks happier and more carefree than I've seen her in a long time. Not since I snuck out to the local swimming hole to watch her and her friends, including Max. I'd stayed back, out of sight, and watched them instead of stepping up and joining them. Those two make a cute pair, don't they? 
Amy asks, nodding in Rose and the guy's direction. I cough to hide my response. Don't you think it's about time you and Rose had a talk? She puts the glass aside and grabs a larger one, filling it to the brim before putting it down at the counter in front of me. Talk about what? I ask. The way you two feel about each other. It's obvious you like each other. It's not that simple. I would promised Rose to keep our relationship a secret. Some complicated family tradition thing, and I'm not about to betray that. Even if it makes me sick to my stomach to watch her in another man's arms. If you don't, you better get ready to look at stuff like that more often. She won't wait around forever. Amy turns to help another customer at the other end of the bar. She's not wrong, Pat says, sitting down in the chair beside me. Aside from our visit here the other night, it's the first time in quite a while that we're spending time together outside of work or family obligations. Probably, but I don't think this is the time or the place to do it. I take a swig of beer. It tastes fine, but it doesn't sit well in my stomach. Something tells me it has nothing to do with the course. Why not? Walk up there and cut in. I'll run interference with Sean if you'd like. You know the guy? I ask, surprised. Met him tonight. Rose introduced us. Sean Perkins from somewhere up in North Carolina. Decent dart player. Gave me a run for my money, Pat says. I doubt that. He moves his head side to side like he's in an old mafia movie. Let's say I had to actually work a little and focus to be him. Don't tell him I said that, though. I won't, I promise. What's he doing in Linden? I have an idea but need confirmation. He's the new ranch hand at Two Oaks. Taking your job, I guess. Patrick shrugs, looking a little more disappointed than I expect. Not quite. Mr. Baker was planning on hiring him even after he took me on. Hmm, so you knew the guy was coming? Patrick asks. Yeah. I just wasn't planning on being stuck at the store when he did. He's moving fast, too. First day in town he's trying to sweep your girl off her feet. Patrick shakes his head and takes a drink. I look at my own beer, stomach churning. She's not my girl, I say. Not really. Not until she's ready to let the world and her dad know we've been seeing each other for the past few months. Right. What's the plan then? Let her go and drown your misery in that? He points to the tall beer in front of me. I don't know. I'm at a loss about what to do here. There wasn't a guidebook for situations like this. In the romance novels my mom keeps stocked in the magazine section, I'm sure the hero would storm over there and kiss the girl senseless. But here, in the real world, that didn't work. I glance up at Rose and the guy, Sean, still stepping it up on the dance floor. She finally notices me, and her smile brightens. At least I think it does. She waves and misses a step. Sean says something that makes her look back at him and laugh. I can't take this anymore. I get up and walk out the door, abandoning a perfectly good glass of beer. Wait up. Patrick calls behind me. I didn't notice he was following me until we're both outside, and the heavy wooden door shuts behind us, dampening the noise from inside. I need some air, I say, hoping he'll go away and leave me to my misery. I feel like I'm about to puke. Let's walk out to the pond. Patrick walks off, then turns in motions for me to follow him. I'm feeling too drained to get into an argument, and maybe a little fresh air will help me feel better before I make my way home to my own place. I haven't been here in ages, I say when the fishing pond comes into view. It's not huge, but it's a pretty spot, off the beaten track. The full moon above us lights up the sky and the old oak that stands proudly guarding the small body of water. Remember when Dad would take us out here fishing on Saturday afternoons? Patrick picks up a rock and skips it across the glassy surface. I do. Simpler times. It was before I fell hard for Rose Baker and before Patrick got hooked on drugs. At least, I think it was. I don't know much about what happened to my brother, only that he was gone one day, and a few months later, we got a call from the police. 
months of rehab and a couple of years at a private school later, he was home, trying hard to earn her trust back. It came little by little with every day he stayed clean and out of trouble. Coming back here after school couldn't have been easy, I say. Staying here to keep an eye on me when you could have gone to college couldn't have been easy either. Pat picks up another rock and throws it with the same precision. I count six skips before it drops into the water. It's a skill I've never mastered, and I shake my head when he offers me a flat rock. It's all in the wrist, he says, demonstrating the move and talking me through it. I know. I can't do it. Sometimes you gotta admit that there are things you won't accomplish in life. I sit down on a large rock that still holds a bit of heat from the sun. I hope you're wrong. I smile. I didn't realize my ability to skip rocks was so important to you. It's not what I'm talking about, Patrick says, dropping the stone he's holding. Want to tell me about it? I ask, scooting over to make room for my twin on the rock. Patrick takes a seat, and it feels a little like sharing a single chair at big dinners when we go back to Colorado to visit family. Do you think Dad will ever trust me? With the store, I mean. He does trust you. He has you running the entire stockroom, and you're closing every night. With Mom looking over my shoulder and checking behind me every step of the way. I know what they're doing. They are worried I'm taking money for drugs, aren't they? Patrick asks. There have been some concerns, I hedge. I've been clean for almost ten years now. Doesn't that count for something, he asks. They are worried because you've been gone so much. And hanging out at the tipsy cow. Patrick laughs, but it's a sad sound that carries across the water and makes the cows on the other side of the pond look up. What else am I supposed to do? I can't keep sitting around at home, waiting for mom and dad to decide I can have my life back, Patrick says a while later. That's not what. It's what it feels like. You're the golden boy, the good son. The one who will one day take over the family business. Then what am I supposed to do? You know you'll always have a job at Linden Grocers, I say. That place only supports one family, and you know it. Besides, I want more than a job. I want the whole thing. A house with a white picket fence, a family, a business I can pass down to my kids. You sound a lot like Dad. I never realized that they shared this dream. I'd always assumed I was the one who would have to take over or let the store go. I messed up. With my record, I don't have a lot of options, Patrick says. And I like the store. I enjoy talking to people and keeping track of inventory. I think I'd be good at the rest of it too, if Dad gave me even half a chance. I had no idea. But you're the oldest and the reliable one. Patrick gets up and grabs a handful of smaller rocks. I don't want it. He turns and looks at me, eyes wide, the moonlight reflecting in them. You're serious? You really don't want to take over the store? Not if I can help it. I'd much rather work somewhere outside, in the fresh air. Somewhere quiet like this. Without people. What I really want to do is paint and make a living from my art, but that's nothing more than a pipe dream. Would you put in a good word with Dad for me? Patrick asks, looking more vulnerable than I've seen him in years. I'll do one better. Starting tomorrow, I'll train you on the accounting system and ordering and all that stuff. Everything Dad has taught me in an effort to groom me as his successor. And I'll talk to Dad. Make sure he knows you're serious about all this. Thanks, man. I don't know what to say. I have a question, though, and I need a truthful answer. Better get this out of the way now before we both get too deep into this new endeavor. Fire away. I'm an open book. Patrick spreads his arms wide and lets the rocks tumble out of his hand. What are you doing in Greenville? Mom and Dad, I don't want to vocalize their worries. Our worries. As if that could bring them back into reality. That's what all the whispers and concerned looks are about. Patrick drops his arm and grins widely. I'm guessing that means you're definitely not meeting up with friends from back in the day. I can practically feel the weight lifting off my shoulders. No, not at all. 
I met this girl online. Woman actually. She has a five-year-old son. Cute as a button. His eyes light up. The boy or the mom? I ask, feeling my own face break out in a smile as wide as his. Both, actually. I'd love to meet them, I say, thinking about what all of this means for him, for me, and for our whole family. I was thinking of bringing her home in a couple of weeks. Maybe warm mom up to the idea first? You're not going to have to do a lot of convincing there. She's been dying for grandchildren for years. I shake my head. This is going to make her day. No, her week. All right then. I might actually make this happen. You two are pretty serious, then? I ask. He nods. We are, and I want to make sure I can take care of them both. In that case, let's start tomorrow morning and get you ready to take over Linden Grocers. I jump up, feeling better than I have in the past hour. Are you absolutely sure you don't want it? I'm sure I could find something else. You are the oldest, Patrick says. I walk over and put my arm around his shoulder. By 15 minutes, and we both know that the fact that I popped out first was pure coincidence. Besides, you actually like running the store. It should go to you. We'll get Dad to see it that way, too. Besides, from the sound of it, you'll have a whole family to take care of. What about you? He asks. What do you want to do? Work for Mr. Baker for the rest of your life? I shake my head. I don't think so. I like the work, and it's nice to see something completely different from the store. To be honest, I don't know what I want or where I want to be. Pretty ridiculous for some our age, right? Patrick shakes his head. Not at all. And I'm glad you're figuring it out. I'm guessing you know who you want to build this new life of yours with, though. Rose? Maybe, I hedge. What is it with everyone trying to get us to come out as a couple? I'm getting the feeling we did a horrible job keeping things on the down low. Unless you're ready to lose her to that Sean guy, you better talk to her and clear things up, Patrick says as we walk back to the parking lot. Rose's car is gone by the time we get there. She must have left while we had our little chat by the pond. She and Mr. Sean Perkins. Chapter 13 Rose Rose, I need you to come look at these papers. Dad calls from his office. It's a small study, just off the living room. Be right there. I finish sending yet another text message, to Caleb. I haven't seen or spoken to him since I caught a glimpse at him at the tipsy cow the other night. By the time I'd made it off the dance floor, he and his brother were gone. Now would be good. Dinner's almost ready, he calls. The man has no patience. Hold your horses. I'm here. I shake my head and skim them before it is time to eat. When I haven't heard from Caleb after dinner, I get a little worried. I'm in the middle of a text asking how his dad's doing when my phone rings. It startles me so much I almost drop the phone in the kitchen sink. It's full of soapy water to soak the dishes from dinner. I've got it, Sean says, grabbing the dish rag when I answer the phone. Lily, what's up? I walk up to my room. Tell your sister we said hello. And ask her to call me, mom calls after me. I heard. I'll call her in a bit, Lily says. I shut the door to my room behind me and sit down in the middle of my bed. Unlike my younger sibling, I'm still staying in the same room I spent my childhood in. Aside from a two-year stint at community college, I haven't spent much time outside of Linden. Part of me wonders what it would have been like to go off for college, like Lily. What's up? Everything going okay at school? I ask. Midterms are brutal, but other than that, everything's fine. More than fine, actually. I'm thinking about bringing Tom home for a few days once we're done. We have a couple of days off, and his folks are away on some business trip. Dad's gonna love that, I say. Thinking about the issue, he is leaving me here at Two Oaks with Caleb, whom he only suspects likes me. He'll have to get over it, Lily says. And sleep with the door wide open, we both say in unison. 
why did you call? Do you need something? I ask, aware that it's my turn to do dishes, and Sean is doing them for me. Can't I call my sister when I miss her? Lily says in mock anguish. Of course you can. But you don't. Spit it out. What's up? You know me too well, Lily says. Please tell me you've read more of Grandma's letters. I've been studying my head off and am in desperate need of a distraction. Her tone is pleading. I laugh. Actually, I have read a couple. And? My sister has no patience. Grandma shared some interesting stuff about some of our ancestors. Lily makes a yawning noise at the other end of the line. Boring. Not really. It's pretty fascinating. Turns out Two Oaks has been run by strong, independent women quite a few times over the years. I pulled a stack of letters from my nightstand where they've been sitting the past few days. The first one was a woman named Emily Baker. She lived during the Civil War and kept things going while her husband was off, fighting for the Confederate Army. Picked the wrong side, that Baker, didn't he? Lily asks. I don't think he had much of a choice. Anyway, he got himself killed, and she kept things running until their son was old enough to take over. Interesting bit of history, but I'm sure that describes most families back then. Lily isn't nearly the history buff I am, but she has a point. Wait until you hear about Grandma Iris's grandmother. That gets her attention. What would she have to do with any of this? Her name was Violet, and she was an only child. Her father insisted that she inherit two oaks and that her husband take the baker name. I scanned the rest of the last letter I read a few nights ago, letting the information I shared sink in. That's unusual. The way Grandma Iris tells it, it was against all odds and traditions and people made quite the fuss about it in town. Oh, I bet that gossip machine was cranked up high. Lily giggles, as entertained as I'd been by the tale of one of our ancestors. I can only imagine. There were more letters and hints that they weren't the only strong baker women, but it was as far as I'd gotten before I started drifting off to sleep. I can't wait to see them when I get home. I guess I should call mom quick, before Tom picks me up. He's taking me out for a quick dinner, and then I am meeting up with my study group at the library. Good luck on your exam. I barely get the words in before she hangs up. I stare at my phone, the half-written text to Caleb still on the screen. Instead of finishing it and hitting send, I grab my car keys. He's dodged me long enough. Where are you going? Mom asks when I walk past the living room. Before I can answer, Lily comes to my rescue, and Mom's phone rings. I'll be back in a bit, I call. A glance in the kitchen shows me that Sean finished the dishes. He's nowhere to be seen, but his truck is sitting in the driveway when I walk outside. I'll thank him later. Driving down the dark country road that takes me into Linden, I think about what's going on with Caleb and me. Sure, he's busy, but something's off. I feel like I'm missing something between the lines of the few text messages we've exchanged. Mostly, I miss the guy. I pull up to his apartment building. There's light on in the window. I think it is his living room. Or maybe it's the kitchen. I smile and ring the doorbell. I ring again when there's no answer. Then I send a text. Still nothing. Finally, I make the call. It goes straight to voicemail. Hey, it's me, Rose. I'm at your place. Thought we could talk. Call me when you get this. I hang around for a few minutes to see if he calls back or opens the door. When I don't hear back from him, I get back into the car and drive home. As I make my way back to Two Oaks, I'm wondering if asking him to keep our relationship a secret was a mistake. Not that it's much of one yet. A few stolen kisses, a handful of private conversations. But I like him, and I can see this going somewhere. It's the first time I've felt something like this for a member of the opposite sex. That was a quick trip. Everything okay? Sean asks when I walk up the steps that lead to the front door. 
He almost makes me jump, sitting there in the dark, the glimmer from his lit cigarette the only illumination. I didn't know you smoked. Bad habit. He walks past me and drops the cigarette to the ground, using his boot to put it out. Date gone wrong? Checking in on a friend who wasn't home. I walk up to the door. The Caleb guy? Sean asks. If you ask me, he isn't worth your time if you have to go chasing after him all over town. I shake my head. What do you say you and I hit the tipsy cow? Grab a couple of cold ones and do another two-step. He puts his hand on my shoulder. I don't think so. I'm calling it an early night. It's not the first time he's put his hands on me. Always in a seemingly innocent gesture, but it's giving me the creeps. I thought he'd get the point that I'm not interested, but so far, no luck. You sure? You don't know what you're missing. The porch light turns on just in time for me to see him wriggle his eyebrows. Listen, Sean. You're a nice enough guy, but I'm not interested. The door opens, and Mom sticks her head out. Oh good, you're home. Your sister called. She's coming for a visit. In a whisper, she continues. And she's bringing a boyfriend. I know. I laugh, relieved at the escape route that's opened up in front of me. I walk into the house. Marybell, our cat, weaves around my legs, purring. I bend down to pet her. When Sean steps inside behind me, she hisses and runs off. Another strike against the ranch hand my dad thinks so highly of. Maybe dad and I need to have a talk about him. And about Caleb. Rose. Lily jumps out of the car and runs up to hug me. It hasn't been that long, has it? I ask, surprised by her exuberance. I missed you, and I can't wait to read grandma's letters. Ah. That explains it. We've always been fairly close, but not that close. And I want you to meet Tom. Tom, this is my big sister Rose. She motions for a young man who's easily six foot three and thin as a rail to come up. He holds out his hand and smiles big, obviously happy to meet Lily's family. It's nice to meet you. This place is amazing. How old's the building? Tom. One question at a time. Lily links her arm with his. And I'll tell you all about Two Oaks' famous history, including some new stuff we just found out that goes all the way back to the Civil War. Cool. The two of them walk off, and I understand Lily's sudden interest in family history. Or probably any kind of history from the glassy look in her eyes when she cranes her neck to stare up at the guy. Cute couple, Sean says. I don't know where he came from. Aren't you leaving? I ask. Dad told me last night that Sean was taking a couple of days off to visit family. Leaving now. Try not to miss me too much. He holds up his duffel bag and saunters off to his car. I shake my head and start to hum a tune, looking forward to a week with Lily and a day or two without Sean. If only I could get Caleb to respond with more than a line or two of text, all would be right with my world. What do you say? Buttercup. Want to go for a nice long trail ride later? I ask as I step into the stable. I take her snort as an affirmative and get to work on morning chores. It's nice to have your sister home, Dad, says a few minutes later. He grabs a pitchfork and between the two of us, we make quick work of morning chores. That Tom fella seems nice, he says, when we're about done. He does. Not that I've spent much time with him yet, but he made a good first impression. I'm glad she's finding someone, special. How about you? You seem to be taking this whole thing with Max a lot harder than I thought. Are you going to be okay? You know, with their big wedding coming up and all that? I'm stunned. I didn't think my dad would be tuned into all the nuptial chatter about Maeve and Max's big day. I'm fine, dad. Really? Actually, there's something. Breakfast is ready, mom calls from across the yard. You were saying? Dad puts the wheelbarrow away, and we walk out the door. Nothing important. 
we can talk about it later. Let's go eat. This isn't something I want to get into in the 30 seconds it takes us to get to the house and definitely not something I want to discuss in front of Lily and her new beau. Alright, but don't forget. I feel like we haven't spent much time together. Dad puts his arm around me as we walk into the house. The scent of pancakes and bacon is thick in the air. You two better hurry if you want any food. Mom looks pleased by the amount of food piled on Tom's plate. And after breakfast, I want to see those letters, Lily says, popping a bite of bacon into her mouth. You've got it, sis. Mom hands me a cup of coffee, and all feels right with the world. Chapter 14 Caleb Something on your mind? Dad asks why I carry a couple of ham and cheese sandwiches up. What makes you say that? I ask. You're fiddling around with that tray and won't meet my eye. Besides, I could have come downstairs to eat. Aren't you supposed to be on bed rest? I ask when he sits up and swings his legs over the side of the bed. Modified rest. I can get up and move around a bit as long as I keep my ribs wrapped. He sits up and takes his plate. That's good news. Any idea when you'll be back on your feet? I take the chair across from him and bite into the sandwich I made. Anxious to get back to working for Baker? Dad asks, seeing right through me. He hired some new guy. Ah. Let me guess, he's making eyes at Rose? Dad takes a bite of his sandwich, leaving me no choice but to answer. Honestly, I don't know what's going on. I'm more worried about the job, though. I like being out there. What is it exactly that you like better than working at the store, he asks. It's the first time he's shown any interest in why I started working at Two Oaks. I take a moment to think, trying to find a way to put it into words that will resonate with him. I like the wide open spaces and the quiet. The barn and the pastures aren't full of people who keep asking me the same questions over and over. Ah, that does get annoying sometimes, doesn't it? But there are also beautiful moments when you see the gratitude in their eyes when we have the birthday candles they forgot or the medicine that will help their sick baby sleep. My dad's face softens. He lives for those moments. Being of service is a big part of why he's so good at running the store. You're right, it's nice. But for me, it doesn't make up for all the stuff I don't like. The monotony. Looking at the same walls and displays all day long. Missing the sun on my face, I lean back and relax into the chair. Images of two oaks and some of my favorite spots around Linden flash through my head. Places that inspire me to paint in an attempt to capture the essence of them. To capture what I see at that particular moment in time. I had no idea you felt that way. I thought you were happy taking over the store. Dad puts his plate down and gives me his full attention. Honestly, I thought that's what you wanted what you expected me to do. And don't get me wrong. I'm happy enough, and it's an amazing opportunity. Just not the one you want. I shake my head. I know someone who does, though. Someone who feels like you and would make a much better fit than me, I say, watching my father carefully. Who, he asks. Patrick. I give him time to take in what I said. I can see the gears in his head spinning. Weighing the risks. Thinking back on how much time my brother puts into the place. The ideas and suggestions he's come up with. His interactions with the customers that mirror our father so much more than mine do. You think he's up for it? The responsibility and the stress, he asks. Good. At the very least, he's open to the idea. I do. You don't think the pressure could, you know? push him to relapse? I don't think so. If you ask me, trust and more responsibility are exactly what he needs to keep his nose clean. He needs something he'd lose if he ever even thinks about using again. Not that I think he will. I remember the look on his face when he told me about his girlfriend and her daughter. He'd never do anything to hurt them and is thriving with the extra responsibility a family of his own brings. I'm sure Dad will see it when Patrick gets around to breaking the news and brings the two up for a visit. 
Maybe you're right. Let me think about that. He picks his sandwich back up, and we finish in silence, both of us deep in thought. How about this? Teach Patrick what he needs to know about orders and working with suppliers. All he needs is the basics for now, and the two of you can switch shifts. We can open an hour later, and if your brother doesn't mind staying a little longer, you could scale back. Put in a few hours at night and close up shop. Are you serious? I ask. I don't remember our hours ever changing. It's pretty quiet for the first hour. I doubt it would hurt business. Might actually save us some money in the long run. And it would give you a chance to get back to work at the ranch in the mornings. I'm stunned when I walk downstairs to clean up after lunch. What's for dinner? I ask when I walk back into the door of my parents' house after a quick trip to my place to shower, check the mail, and pay my bills. Spaghetti and meatballs. Nothing fancy. Mom pulls a tray of Texas toast from the oven. It smells amazing, I say, noticing how tired she looks. The past week hasn't been easy for any of us. It does. Is someone taking Patrick a plate? Dad shuffles into the kitchen, his face white from the exertion of making his way down the stairs. Are you sure you're up for eating down here? I can bring up a tray if you. Dad holds up a hand, and Mom stops. I've been lying around for too long. I want to have a meal sitting up at the table like a civilized person. Besides, you heard Dr. Thompson. I need to move around and keep the blood flowing. Move around a little. To the bathroom and back. Not up and down the stairs all day. Mom's eyebrows are drawn together with concern. I pull a chair out and motion for him to sit. Dad grabs hold of the table and gingerly lowers himself down. Thanks. You're welcome. What do you want to drink? I ask, walking to the fridge. Water's fine. He turns to look at my mother. Besides, I'm not running up and down the stairs. This is the first time I've come down today, and I promise you it will be the last. For today. Now what about Patrick? The boy needs to eat. I'm saving him a plate, and he's coming over after he closes up shop, Mom says, fixing a plate for him. Good. I want to talk to him. Have him come up after he's eaten. Dad doesn't look at me, but I know this conversation is a direct result of the one we had earlier today. I'll make sure he does. Now eat, both of you, before the food gets cold. She sets two plates down and turns to fix her own. Thanks, Mom. I hand Dad his water and fix one for her as well. I'm happy to see your painting again, Mom says halfway through the meal. How do you know? I ask, surprised. Rose is the only person who's seen my latest pieces, and I haven't exactly been on speaking terms with her since I saw her dancing with that Sean guy. Mom laughs and points to the sleeves of my shirt. It's on your pants, too. These are clean. I just put them on. I look down at what I'm wearing, and sure enough, you can see a few paint splatters that didn't come off in the wash. And you had paint on the back of your arm the other day when we were restocking the jellies and jams, she adds, with a soft smile. I've just been playing a little here and there. Nothing major, but ever since I'd shown Rose my work, I'd been itching to get out there to capture something new. Any chance I get to see what you've been working on? Mom asks. Dad watches our conversation quietly, slowly eating his food. I can tell he's still struggling to breathe. Actually, I can. I'd taken pictures of a few pieces with my phone. I'd plan on sending them to Rose and Chicken Out. Better to talk to her in person when I get back to working at Two Oaks. That's lovely, honey. It's the entrance to Two Oaks, isn't it? She uses her fingers to zoom in for a better look. It's not the best shot and the actual painting is much better, but it's good enough to give her the gist of my work. It is. There are some other sketches and stuff, but that's the only thing I've finished. It's lovely. Look, Carl. Isn't that beautiful? She hands the phone to my father. Dad studies the image for a long time, zooming in the way Mom did. Finally, 
He looks up at me. That's impressive. I didn't know you were this good. His stunned look makes me laugh. I've been painting and sketching since I was five. Yet this is the first time Dad's taken more than a glance at my work. I told you he's good. His art teacher wanted him to go to some fancy college, remember? Mom takes the phone back and looks at the picture again. I think I do, Dad says thoughtfully. Art college hadn't been anything other than a pipe dream. One that disappeared quickly when I realized my life was here in Linden and I was better served with a business degree from the local community college. Plus, it gave me the chance to spend time around Rose. Not that she'd noticed me or seen me as more than a friend from high school. Do me a favor, Caleb, and email me that picture, Mom says when she clears away the plates. Why? I ask. It's been a long time since you've given me a piece of your art. I'd like to look again sometime. Coffee anyone? Both Dad and I nod, and I push back the feeling of guilt for not sharing more of my art with her. Mom has always been my biggest cheerleader and supporter. I will under one condition, I say. What's that? She turns and walks to the sink to fill the coffee carafe with water. You have to promise that you're not going to go all around town showing it to people and bragging about how talented your son is. Dad grunts in poorly veiled amusement. What's wrong with that? She asks, finishing the coffee and pushing the button to start it brewing. Within seconds, the rich scent of hazelnut-flavored coffee fills the air. It's embarrassing. Besides, I have plans for the original. I bet I can guess what, Dad mumbles under his breath. What kind of plans? Mom asks, standing in front of me with one hand on her hip. I thought I'd give it to the bakers. You know, as a thank you for being so understanding with Dad and the store and all that. I shoot my father a sideways glance, worried he'd be annoyed at the reminder of the upheaval he's caused. Baker has been good about that. I figured he'd tell you to not bother coming back. Gotta respect a man that values family, he says instead. And I think it's a lovely idea. Mrs. Baker will love it. Mom puts a cup in front of each of us and pours fresh coffee into them the moment it's finished brewing. When I make it home to my place, I pull out a clean canvas and sketch out a bouquet of sunflowers. They've always been Mom's favorite and would make a nice subject for a soft watercolor piece. Chapter 15 Rose Now, can I see the letters? Lily asks when we clear the table after breakfast the next morning. It's a Saturday, and Dad and Tom volunteered to take over morning chores. As soon as we're done here, I say, feeling generous since I got to sit inside, sipping coffee, scrolling through my phone and chatting with my mom and sister. It's a rare treat and always appreciated. Even though I'm tempted to sneak out to check on Buttercup and take her one of the apples in the bowl on the kitchen counter. I can't believe you haven't read all of them, Lily says, drying the cast iron pan and putting it on the hot stove to remove the last residues of moisture. Don't get me wrong, I'm tempted, but then it would be, I swallow hard. It would be like she's gone for good. You know what I mean? Better to have a few things left unsaid. Lily hangs up her towel and wraps her arms around me. I miss her, too. Let's go look at what you've read so far and we'll go from there. I nod and blink the tears away that still threaten to flow whenever I remember the older woman who'd meant so much to both of us. And who knows, if there's one stack of letters, she may have tucked another one away somewhere else. Lily takes the stairs, two at a time, racing to the upper floor where all our bedrooms are at. I doubt it. We would have found them when we cleaned out her room. The room that was now Sean's. I shake my head, dispelling any thoughts of the man who was becoming a serious pain in my behind. You never know. She pulls the door to my room open and gets on the bed, holding her hands out for the letters like she's five. Here you go. This is the first one. I pull the first of the letters from its envelope and hand it to Lily. She sits and reads it quietly, wiping her eyes, before handing the letter back to me. I sit down beside her and switch it for the next one. And the last one I've read. Wow. That's something else, isn't it? 
Lily asks. I guess it's more powerful in her words than what I told you over the phone and in texts. I put my arm around my little sister, my eye catching a glimpse of the picture of grandma and the two of us I keep on my desk. You can say that. I'm at need a minute here. Next time, remind me to wear waterproof mascara. She laughs while one more tear runs down her cheek, leaving a dark trail behind it. The facial cleanser is under the sink when you're ready. Thanks. She climbs off the bed and vanishes into the bathroom. We should go do something fun. Get out of the house for a bit. Wanna go for a ride? Show Tom around the rest of the property? I ask. That'd be great. He's never ridden, though. Lily pokes her head out of the bathroom. Her face is clean. Got some makeup? I don't want to risk running to my room and have Tom see me without my face on. I laugh. She looks fine without it. Younger, but just as beautiful. Top drawer. That's it? Tinted moisturizer, lip gloss, and mascara? She holds the three items that make up my makeup collection in her hand. That's all you really need, I shoot back. Right. We're going shopping, sis. You are in desperate need of a makeover. Her head disappears, and I catch a glimpse of her applying the moisturizer about twice as thick as when I do on the rare occasion I use it. You think Tom is up for a ride? We could put him on Daisy, I call to her. Good thinking. I'm sure he'd love it. You should have seen him jump at the chance to help dad with chores this morning. Her comment makes me think of Caleb. He'd been eager to work here as well. On a whim, I pull out my phone and text him to see if he wants to join us for a ride. Three dots appear almost immediately. I stare at the phone. Watching them disappear and start up again. Finally, a single line of text appears. Sure. What time? When can you and Tom be ready? I'm asking Caleb to join us, I call out. Oh, fun. Half an hour? Lily is expertly applying mascara before musing her hair and walking back into the room. Let's see if he can make it over here that fast. It takes Caleb a good 45 minutes, and we have all four horses saddled and ready to go. Tom does well, despite the fact that this is the first time he's been on a horse in years. You've ridden before? Caleb asks. Not really. I've sat on a horse a few times on vacation. You know, when they lead you around on the beach and stuff like that. It's been a couple of years, though, Tom says. Glad I'm not the only one who didn't ride before they could walk. Caleb rides next to Tom, and the two men chat as we make our way to the far end of the Two Oaks property. Anybody ready for lunch? Lily asks when we make it to the large oak. I'm not sure I'm ready to eat, but I wouldn't mind some time out of the saddle. Caleb jumps up. Tom, on the other hand, reaches for one of the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches Lily made as soon as she pulls them out of her saddlebag. I grab the frozen water bottles from my own bag. They are half melted and have been sloshing around with each of Buttercup strides for the last half an hour. How do you like working at Two Oaks? Lily asks Caleb when the four of us stretch out in the shade of the oak tree. I haven't been here for a while, but overall, I like it a lot. He turns to me. I might be able to come back most days starting next week. If that's okay with your dad. I'm sure he'd like that, and we can definitely use the help. I take his hand and squeeze it. Lily looks at us and opens her mouth. I take charge of the situation before she can get a word out. Caleb and I have been seeing each other. No kidding. About time you two are coming out as a couple. Lily shakes her head and smiles. How? Never mind. I haven't had a chance to talk to Dad yet, I say, scooting closer to Caleb. He puts his arm around me and pulls me into his side. Don't worry. My lips are sealed, Lily says. I'll tell him next chance I get, I promise, turning to Caleb. It's time he gives up on the idea of me and Max or someone like him for good. Someone like Sean? 
Caleb asks. Oh please, have you met the guy? I groan. I haven't. But you seem to have a pretty good time dancing with him the other night. Caleb scoots back far enough to look me in the eye. Ouch, Lily said. I think that's our cue to boogie. Ready to get back on that horse? She looks at Tom. Yes, and good idea. Didn't you want to go catch some band in Greenville this afternoon, anyway? We should probably get going if we want to make it in time. You're serious about taking our relationship public? Caleb asks after they leave. I am. What about Sean? He's standing under the tree, his back leaning against the thick trunk. He's getting on my last nerve. There's something wrong with the guy. I just can't put my finger on what it is, but something's off. I didn't realize how much he's been getting on my nerves until I've had this brief break from him. When is he coming back? Caleb asks, pushing off and walking over to check on Paisley, the horse he's been riding since he first asked me to teach him. Tomorrow, I think. I didn't ask. I tuck the empty water bottles back into my saddlebag and look around for anything else we may have left behind. Hmm, Caleb walks back to the tree where he stashed the messenger bag he's been carrying with him since he got back to the ranch this morning. This is really bothering you, isn't it? I walk over and take his hand. There is nothing going on between us. I swear. It didn't look that way when you were dancing. Amy thought you two made a cute couple. He puts his bag down but doesn't pull his hand out of mine. I think Amy was trying to push your buttons. Dad asked me to show him the bar and buy him a beer. It was his first night, and honestly, I didn't know how annoying he could be yet. The guy thinks way too highly of himself. Seemed like a good dancer, though. Caleb's tone is doubtful. I let out a sad little excuse for a laugh. It's his only redeeming quality. That and the fact that he's figured out how to handle Diabolo. Trust me, if it was up to me, he'd be gone. Actually, I never would have hired him in the first place. You really think there's something going on with the guy? Caleb asks. I shrug. I guess you'll find out for yourself when you come back. Caleb nods and pulls his hand from mine. Crouching down, he pulls a small canvas from his bag. I want to show you something. Another piece? I crouch down to join him. I started it a couple of days before my dad's accident. Finally, got a chance to finish it. I was thinking of giving it to your parents. He turns the canvas around, and I stare at the two oaks that frame the entry of the drive to the house. They are the namesake of the ranch and have been a constant in my life for as long as I can remember. He captured them perfectly. The imagery feels like home. What do you think, he asks, his eyes on me. I have to peel mine from the painting. It's perfect. You think they'd like it? Caleb asks, carefully returning it to the bag. I do. And if they don't, I'd be proud to display the piece of art. Are you in a rush to get back? Caleb asks, his hand still on the bag. I shake my head. Mind if I paint for a little while? I love this landscape and brought a few supplies. Just a quick little painting. Shouldn't take long. Take your time. I watch him pull a thick sketchbook and a small tray of watercolors from his bag. Is there any water left? He asks. Here. I hand him my water bottle. It's more than half empty, but he doesn't seem to mind. As the afternoon sun warms my back, I watch him paint. A few strokes with a pencil set the scene of Buttercup grazing in front of the rolling fields. A few trees break up the landscape along with the fence that encloses the back pasture. It's fascinating to see him capture the essence of what's spread out in front of us in a few quick strokes. Then the paints come out, and the image comes to life. You're good, you know, I say, looking over his shoulder. He looks up, surprised. I enjoy it. It's the moment I realize that this is his passion. He feels about his art the way I feel about our horses. A life's work, a project that never ends. 
the constant drive to improve and get better at what we do. I lean back and let him work, enjoying that he's comfortable enough around me to lose himself in his work. I doubt he does this around a lot of people. Watch it, he says. My eyes fly open. I didn't realize I was about to nod off in the warm quiet of the afternoon. Paisley is standing over him, nibbling on Caleb's hair. I think she's jealous. You're only painting Buttercup, and she noticed. I get up and grab her reins, leading her to a tasty-looking patch of grass a few feet away. When I return, Caleb is putting the finishing touches on his painting. I don't think horses see color the way we do. I'm not sure their vision is good enough to see any of this. Don't they mostly perceive movement? Caleb asks, rinsing his brush in the last of the water. It's a strange brown color that looks a bit like cold coffee that's been sitting on the counter all day. That was a joke. I think she's ready to head back home, though. Probably tired of wearing the saddle. I look at the mare, tossing her head, already bored with the patch of grass. Can't blame her. They don't exactly look comfortable, do they? Look at you, getting all worried about the horses, I tease. He grabs a second brush, the one he used to paint the dark green of the oak leaves. Before I realize what he's doing, he brushes wet paint across the bridge of my nose. Hey! I reach up and rub the damp splotch. Stop. You'll smear it all over your face. Caleb pulls a handkerchief from his back pocket that's covered in paint and finds a clean corner. So gently, I can barely feel it, he rubs the watercolor off my face. Sorry about that, he says, his head moving closer. I can feel his warm breath wash over my face. Don't worry about it, I reply just as softly before leaning in and touching my lips to his. They are warm and firm the way I remembered. I wrap my arms around his neck and feel his strong hand cradle the back of my head, pulling me closer to deepen the kiss. I lose myself in the sensation of our lips dancing together to a music all our own. Nothing matters except feeling him, smelling him, and tasting the essence that's so uniquely Caleb. Sharp pain on the top of my head pulls me back into the here and now. I tilt back and reach up, my fingers touching a soft, slightly damp nose. Paisley, stop it. Let go of Rose's hair. Caleb jumps up, causing the mare to dance back, pulling out a few strands of my hair. Ouch. I rub the spot where they were violently removed and turn to look at the horse accusingly. Buttercup walks up to see what's going on. We should go, I say when he offers me his hand and pulls me up. Sure about that. He pulls me closer and gives me a quick kiss on the top of my nose. Afraid so. Paisley's getting impatient, and I don't want to lose any more hair. I kiss the corner of his mouth, tempted to get back to where we left off a moment ago. Well, the good news is, I'll be able to do this a lot more often once you talk to your father. Caleb pulls me in for one last quick kiss before we get on the horses and make our way back to the house. And reality. Chapter 16 Caleb It's nice to see you, Caleb. Sit down, have a cup of coffee before you head out to the barn, Mrs. Baker says when I walk into the house on Monday morning. That's okay. I'm just stopping by to let Mr. Baker know I'm reporting back for duty. And to give you this. I hand a paper grocery bag to Rose's mother. What's this? She opens it and pulls the painting out. It's beautiful. Where did this come from? I painted it the other day and thought you might like it. I look around for Rose but don't see her. I don't remember seeing her car in the drive either. I do. Very much. Rose isn't here, by the way. She and her sister went into Greenville for some girl time and shopping. I heard something about a makeover. I'm sure they'll have a good time. Mrs. Baker laughs. You sound as relieved as my husband that you weren't included in the trip. How about you? Didn't you want to join them? I ask. She shakes her head. I'm too old for that nonsense, plus my girls rarely get to spend time together with just the two of them. 
I seriously doubt you're too old to go on a little shopping spree, but I take your point. It's nice of you to let them spend time by themselves. I turn and look toward the door, trying to figure out how to make my exit. Go ahead. I'm sure they can use an extra hand in the stables, Mrs. Baker says with a chuckle. And thank you for this. I'll have to find a place to hang this. You don't have to, I say, earning me a stare that makes me wish I could take my words back. Of course I do. This is beautiful and very much appreciated, Caleb. She shoes me out the door. Look who's decided to show up. Here to work? Sean calls out when I walk down to the stables. I am. I look the man right in the eye, my dislike of him growing. Is your dad doing better? Tom walks out of a stall, pitchfork in hand. He is. Thanks for asking. I nod at Lily's boyfriend. He's a nice guy. Especially standing next to Sean with that stupid smirk on his face, boots crossed, leaning against the wall of Buttercup's stall. Might as well put you to work, then. Sean hands me his own pitchfork. Diablo's stall needs mucking out. And you don't mind taking care of Marigold and her little runt, do you? Not at all. I grab the fork from him and walk down the lane. Don't forget to add fresh straw. Wheelbarrow is down the hill. Sean motions out the door I walked in a moment ago. Got it, I call over my shoulder. The guy is a jerk, and I can guess why. I watch Sean as we work our way through the remaining chores. He's good, I'll give him that. He knows what he's doing, and he's fast. Doesn't mean I like him, though. He's a little full of himself, isn't he? Tom asks when he joins me to help with Marigold and Star. The young foal is faster than I expected and tries to sneak out of the stall. Watch out, I call when Star gets past me and makes a run for it, taking off toward the barn door. Sean looks up, sprints to the barn door, and pulls it shut. Keep her in the stall, he calls down to us. Marigold doesn't like that idea one bit. It takes both Tom and me to calm her down. Even so, she's craning over the stall door. All three of us are keeping a close eye on Star. Sean calmly approaches the weak old horse and manages to corner him. With gentle prodding and years of horse experience that's apparent even to a newbie like me, he coaxes him down the lane. He looks at me and nods. I open the stall door, doing my best to block Marigold. Star shoots inside and takes refuge next to his mother. He half disappears under her, and by the time Tom and I exit their stall, he's nursing, Mom licking his side to calm him and herself down. Or at least I think that's what she's doing. Maybe she's trying to wash the scent of Sean off her offspring instead. Who could blame her? That was something else, man. I thought for sure the little guy was on his way out to greener pastures, Tom says. We both stare at him. Not like that. Sneaking out to the actual pastures, or down the driveway. I don't know where he thought he was going. Tom's cheeks turn pink. Neither do I. He's gonna be a special kind of horse. He has spunk, like his daddy. Sean looked at the foal before strolling down the lane to see Diablo. Holding his hand up to the midnight black stallion, he pats his head and speaks softly to him. That was some quick thinking, I say, stepping up beside him. Diablo gives me the side eye, and I get the feeling the progress he and I made before has evaporated into nothing. No big deal. Not the first time that happened, Sean says. He gives Diablo one more pat on the nose, turns his back on me, and walks away. I shake my head, and it's all I can do not to roll my eyes when I see Tom looking at both of us. The door to the barn slides open, daylight, and a soft breeze streaming in. What's going on here? Why was this door shut? Mr. Baker asks. I can only make out his silhouette against the sudden increase of light, but the tone of his voice leaves no doubt that he isn't happy. We had a little incident. Caleb over here let Star out of his stall, but I kept the situation under control. He's back with Mom. Sean raises his thumb across his shoulder back in my direction. Caleb, you're back. Mr. Baker looks surprised to see me. I am, sir. 
Hope that's all right with you. Of course it is. Sean here has been pulling his weight, but with Rose distracted, we could sure use the help. How's your dad doing? He asks, walking over to join me. Much better and ready to get back to work. Mom's having a hard time keeping him from doing too much. Mr. Baker pats me on the back. I'm glad he's back in the store. Let me know if you need to take off early. I appreciate that, but I should be fine. At least I hope I won't get a frantic call or text for the next couple of hours. At least not until I get a chance to see Rose. Mr. Baker, can I have a word? Sean shoots me a look that makes me think I'm in trouble and walks out of the barn with Rose's dad. Any idea what that was about? Tom asks. I shake my head. Not a clue. I watched you. Star getting out wasn't your fault. I'm happy to tell Mr. Baker that. Don't worry about it. We work in chat and have the barn in top shape in no time at all. I'm liking this little town more than I thought I would. You guys really have everything you need in one place around here, Tom says when we take a short break in the sun. I stretch my legs out in front of me and lean back against the warm wall of the barn. The hay bales that serve as our bench are surprisingly comfortable. Where did you grow up? I ask. Louisville, Kentucky. You know, cul-de-sac, picket fence. He shrugs his shoulders. I'm sure you had a whole lot more going on than we do here in Linden. It's just a lot more noise. And traffic. Makes you not even want to go anywhere. He leans his head back and closes his eyes. I can see that. I'd never been to Louisville, but I picture it a lot like Greenville. It's why I went to Clemson. Nice little town. We can walk to almost anything from campus, he says. How about you? Where did you go to school? Around here, Community College. It seemed like the reasonable choice at the time. Now I can't help but wonder if I missed out on my one chance to get out of this town. At least for a little while. Smart move. It's going to take me ages to pay off my loans. I'm not as lucky as Lily with that big scholarship of hers that covers almost all of her tuition. He sits up and looks out across the field. Must be nice. She always done well in school and graduated as valedictorian of her class. Right. Tell me about it. Who knows, maybe I can get Mr. Baker to take me on for the summer. How's the pay? Tom asks. I laugh. Don't even think about it. You're not taking my job. How about Sean's? Tom looks at me, his eyes sparkling with mischief. That's fine with me, I say, hoping there was a way for it to happen. Or for Sean to be gone long before then. Hey there, stranger. Rose walks up to me, and we both do our best to ignore Lily and Tom, who are acting like they haven't seen each other for at least three months. I'm good. How was your girl's day out? I ask. Rose's hair looks different, and I like the way her face is made up. It's subtle, and the lipstick color suits her. It was fun. Rose turns to me and lowers her voice. But to be honest, I'm ready to grab a shower and wash all this gunk off. It looks nice, I say, earning me a big smile. There you are, girls. Did you have a nice time together? Mrs. Baker steps out on the porch and joins the small congregation in the driveway. We did. And we brought back some goodies for you. Lily tears herself from Tom's arms and dashes to the car. She comes back with an armful of bags. I tried to slow her down, Rose says. I failed. Well, lunch is about ready. Bring that stuff inside and come eat, Mrs. Baker says, eyeing the bags suspiciously. I hold back a laugh. She reminds me so much of her daughter at the moment. Give me a minute to check on Buttercup, Rose says. You're welcome to join us, Caleb, Mrs. Baker calls out to me. There's plenty of food. I appreciate it, but I have to head on back. My mom needs me in the store this afternoon. I was pushing my time here on two oaks already, but it was too tempting to stick around until Rose got back. 
I walk with her down to the barn, and we chat about anything and everything, including her morning out and my father's improving health. We should head to Greenville together sometime. I think you'd like that bagel place we stopped at for brunch, Rose says. I'd like that. Before I can ask her when and where she wants to go, her dad and Sean take notice of us. Hey there, apple of my eye. How was your morning out? Mr. Baker walks up. Honestly? Exhausting. Lily had me trying on at least two dozen different dresses. None I would ever actually wear. She was always the more girly of the two of you. Her father looks at her with pride in his eyes. Mom says lunch is ready. I just came in to say hello to my girl over here. Rose walks up to Buttercup's stall. Good, I'm starving. Sean, you're ready? Mr. Baker asks. You bet. Sean walks up and turns to face me. You don't mind feeding Diablo some hay cubes before you come in, do you? He's not staying, and I can take care of it, Rose says. I put a hand on her arm, removing it quickly before her father notices. I can do it before I leave. I turn to Sean and Mr. Baker. I'm about to head out to work in the grocery store. Is there anything else you need me to do before I leave? Sean opens his mouth, but Mr. Baker speaks first. Nothing else I can think of. Give your father my best. Sure you don't want to join us for lunch? I shake my head. I've been here too long already. Don't worry. I'll keep Rose company, Sean says, holding his arm out for my girl. I grit my teeth and keep my mouth shut, but it's a close call. I'll be there in a couple of minutes. You two go ahead and wash up. I'm right behind you, Rose says. Where are Lily and Tom? Her father asks. Already inside. In that case, we better hurry. If there's one thing I can say about this Tom guy, it's that he can eat. Mr. Baker walks out of the barn, taking Sean with him. I thought he liked Tom, I say, surprised. He does. In his own way. Dad has issues with his little girl's dating. She walks up and pets Buttercup's nose. The mare lowers her head until her nose is buried in Rose's hair. She raises it and makes some weird noise that can only be described as a mix between a sneeze and a snort. The expression on her face makes both of us laugh. I guess you're not a fan of the makeover, either. Don't worry, pretty girl. I'm washing all this product out of my hair the first chance I get. And then you and I will spend some quality time together. You two do that. Any idea where you guys keep the hay cubes? I ask. And what exactly are those? Compressed cubes of hay. Think of them as snack food for horses. Not sure why we need to supplement Diablo's diet with them, but they are in the blue barrel over there. Make sure you close the lid when you're done. She motions for a barrel sitting just outside the barn door, under the large overhang of the roof. You've got it. Diablo gets excited about his special snack, and I can't help but hope that it'll buy me a few bonus points with the temperamental horse. By the time I walk back, Rose is ready to head inside for lunch. See you tomorrow, I say before getting into my car. I'd like that. Her words and the longing expression in her eyes carry me through a dreary day at work, and when my head finally hits the pillow that night, I can't wait for my five o'clock alarm the next morning because it means I get to spend more time with my Rose. Chapter 17 Rose Would you hand me those ribbons? I ask, holding out my hand. Caleb drops them into my hand without a word. Something wrong? I ask, looking up. He shakes his head. What exactly are you doing? Having some fun. Plus, it's good for her to get used to me messing with her mane again. I'm thinking of entering a couple of jumping competitions with her. And you need to fancy her hair up for that? Caleb asks, sounding incredulous. I don't have to, but it's always been part of our routine. I take the dark red ribbon and braid it into a thick strand of her mane before repeating the process. Seems like a waste of time to me. And I'm not sure she likes it. What's gotten you so grumpy this morning? 
I ask. I'd enjoyed our mornings working together over the past week. Even if Sean was doing his best to find busy work for Caleb, that keeps him as far away from me as possible. You don't want to know, he mutters. I turn around and face him. I do. Buttercup nudges me in the shoulder, impatient for me to get back to braiding. I turn to hide my triumphant smile. I'm surprised you still haven't told your parents about us. Or Sean. Ah, uh, I've been waiting for this moment. And dreading it. That's all you have to say about it? Caleb says loudly. Sean and my father are working somewhere around here, and the last thing I need is for either of them to find out by overhearing me and Caleb argue about our relationship. Keep your voice down. I turn and whisper shout the words over my shoulder. Seriously? Caleb looks like he's ready to stomp off. I get it, and I want to tell them. My parents. I could care less about Sean. It's just. What? His tone is impatient, but at least he isn't moving. Dad's been talking highly of Sean. He's practically gushing about the guy. I noticed. I've also noticed that he keeps putting the two of you to work together. And that's while I'm here. I don't even want to think about what's going on when I'm gone. And you think I like it? Any of it? I ask, my own voice going up in volume. I take a breath and rein my vocal cords in. What do you want me to do? I'm supposed to be training him. Both of you. And working alongside him to run the ranch. I want you to tell your father that you and I are a couple. That we're together. If that's what we are. I turn around and look Caleb in the eyes. He is angry and hurt. Don't ever question that. That's a big ask, he says, his shoulders falling. I know. Come here. I pull him into Buttercup's stall with me and pull him close. Before he can say a word, I wrap my hands around his neck and kiss the man senseless. That was. Amazing? I'm still breathless from the kiss. I was thinking reckless, but yeah. He smirks and kisses my nose. Buttercup would have warned us if anyone came close. At least I hope she would have. And that the stall walls provided us with plenty of cover from prying eyes. Maybe. Caleb doesn't sound as convinced as I try to sound. I'll talk to him. Soon. When is soon, he asks. Because this is getting. Ridiculous, I know. We're two grown adults who should be able to do what they want to in their free time. And who should be able to date who they want. I need to find the right moment. I can't exactly waltz out there and tell my dad that we've been sneaking around behind his back for months. Why not, he asks. I shrug. I know my dad. Besides, that's not the point. I am growing pretty tired of Sean flirting with you 24-7. Without any success. Plus, I like that this is our little secret. I pull him down for another kiss. To my surprise, he refuses and runs his fingers through his hair instead. I'm tired of secrets, Rose. He turns and walks out of the stall. The rest of the morning, he's doing everything he can to avoid working close to me. What's wrong with him? Sean asks when Caleb takes off down the long drive to head back into town. I don't know what you're talking about. He's fine. He seems off. And he's making even more mistakes than before. What has he done this time, my father asks. I look up, surprised at the tone. As far as I know, Caleb has done an amazing job. He left the light on in the hayloft and did a pretty crappy job cleaning Paisley's hoofs. Her gate is off. I don't think it's anything serious, but if that kind of neglect continues. You've taken care of Paisley the last few days, I say. Sean comes up with some lame excuse that he asked Caleb to do it. Without him here to defend himself, there isn't much I can do. But I'm sure I saw Sean clean her hoofs yesterday. Rose, you need to step up his training, or I'm going to have to rethink keeping him on. Or maybe it would be better if Sean took over for you. 
Seems to me like your head's been elsewhere lately, Dad says. I'm on it, and I'll talk to Caleb, I blurt out as fast as I can. Show me what's going on with Paisley. It's my last night here. Wanna read another of Grandma Iris's letters? Lily asks when we're washing dishes after dinner. What about Tom? I ask. Aside from our trip to Greenville and a few conversations here and there, she and her boyfriend had been attached by the hip. Nah, he's fine. Dad's gotten him into Lonesome Dove. That old TV show? I shake my head. It's his all-time favorite show, but I could never really get into it. Yep. I'm starting to rethink my relationship, Lily says, her eyes telling me that her words are a lie. I heard that, Tom calls from the living room. Good, she calls back, smiling at me. You're mean. I rinse the last of the dishes and hand it to her. Look who's talking. At least I don't keep stringing two guys around at the same time. I'm not doing anything like that. You know me better than to even think I'd sneak around with two guys, I hiss at her, doing all I can to keep my voice low enough to not carry into the living room where Tom's sitting on the couch flanked on each side by our parents. I'm kidding. Let's go look at letters, Lily says, and drags me out of the kitchen and up the stairs. Where did we leave off? I ask. The past few weeks have been busy, and I barely remember what I'd read, let alone shared with my sister. Who cares? Let's open the next one and see what other secrets Grandma Iris has to share. She looks around the room like I'd leave the letters sitting around in the open. I pull the stack from the drawer of my nightstand, and we both climb up to sit on my bed. This is the next one. I pull the ivory envelope from the stack held together with a faded red ribbon. Open it. Lily is practically bouncing on my bed. Calm down, I will. My fingers shake when I tear open the envelope and pull out the thin paper covered in our grandmother's immaculate handwriting. I clear my throat and read. My sweet little Rose. I have one last big secret to share with you, something I never spoke about with your father. I'd plan to, and I'm sure he knows, if not from someone else in the family, then from the papers and deeds for Two Oaks. I don't know why I never sat him down to have this conversation. Not when he was disappointed that you weren't the son he'd expected. Nor when your sister was born. Not even when I watched him eye the young men in Linden to see which one would make a fine husband and worthy heir of Two Oaks as you grew into the amazing young woman you are today. For that I apologize. Maybe it was false pride. Or shame. I don't know. Or maybe I was too tired to get into yet another argument with my son about how to run this place we all love so much and call our home. What do you think it is? This big family secret she never told dad? Lily looks at me with big eyes. I don't know. Maybe dad's illegitimate. That would cause a big scandal, wouldn't it? He doesn't remember his father, does he? Let's not come to any conclusions and see if she tells us in this letter. Knowing my grandmother, it was entirely possible she'd make us go through the entire stack, searching for some big secret that would turn out to be that her hair wasn't naturally the shade of light blonde it is in all the earlier pictures of her I've seen. Keep reading. I scan the page to find my place. What's not talked about much and isn't common knowledge in Linden these days is that I was the heir to Two Oaks. What? Lily's eyebrows are so raised they almost touch her hairline. I read the sentence again, letting the words sink in. Two Oaks came down to her. How? I scan the rest of the letter, speed reading to get the gist of the story. She was an only child and married a third cousin with the same last name. He died when Dad was fifteen months old and ran Two Oaks by herself until she remarried. Papa Ron helped her keep things running until Daddy was old enough to take over. I was not expecting that. And she married her cousin? Lily scrunched up her face. Third cousin. They are barely related. I've studied line breeding for as long as I can remember. Distant cousins marrying is no big deal. Diabolo and Marigold are much closer relations, on both sides, 
and they produce the most valuable offspring. I know, and it is a small town. But still. Lily shakes her head. We're probably related to most of the people in Linden. I know. Good thing I found Tom and Caleb didn't move here until he was what? Six? I shrug. I don't remember exactly when he showed up at school. For years, I didn't take any notice of him. When I did, I was already in a committed, fake relationship with Max and determined to keep my dad from picking my boyfriends. Not that he would have chosen Caleb, anyway. Anyway, what else does Grandma Ira say? I pick the letter back up and scan the last page again. The most important thing I need you to understand is that despite what your father says, you can run two oaks on your own. I've watched you for years. You are the most capable of all of us, and I have no doubt that you, my dear granddaughter, will do amazing things here. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Much love. Grandma. I wipe a tear from my eye and watch Lily do the same. I miss her, I say, my voice breaking for the first time. Me too. Lily pulls me into a tight hug. And she's right, you know. You will do amazing things here. With or without Caleb. With Sean, I'm not so sure. There's something about that guy I don't like. There is nothing going on with me and Sean, I say for the third time tonight. Sure, the guy is flirting with me non-stop but I'm doing everything I can to discourage him. Why keep Caleb such a big secret, then? I swear, you get this from Grandma. I laugh and pull away from my little sister. I don't, I say. We didn't have much time to talk since the picnic the other day. I've had my suspicions for quite a while. I'm not blind. I have eyes. I saw the way the two of you looked at each other when you thought no one was around. You still do, by the way. It wasn't a big surprise when you finally fessed up on the trail ride. Okay. Maybe we needed to be more careful. Or spent less time around each other here on the ranch. Seriously, why don't you just tell them? Mom and Dad? Lily motions for the door like she's expecting me to waltz down there and declare my love for a man we've known most of our lives right in the middle of them, streaming an episode of Lonesome Dove. I don't know. Dad thought for so long that I was with Max. I don't know how to tell him about this without rocking the boat. Or admitting how long we'd been seeing each other without telling them. Or anyone. Is this about two oaks? Lily jumps off the bed and huffs. That's ridiculous. What's he gonna do? Leave it to me? I don't want it. I couldn't wait to get out of here fast enough. Tom seems to like it here, I say, to change the subject. For a few days, sure. But he's used to the comfort of the city. Or anything bigger than Linden, really. Besides, we have big plans, and they don't involve being tied down to this place. That's your gig, your dream. She was right. Running two oaks has been my dream for as long as I remember having dreams. I can't imagine doing anything else. Or more truthfully, I'd never even considered anything else. Why would I? This place is paradise. For the most part. That's not why. I search for words, for an explanation of why this isn't the right time and come up empty. Sis, I think you have some thinking to do. Will you get into an argument with Dad about Caleb? Probably. But if his opinion about this and two oaks are more important than Caleb, then maybe he isn't the one. Lily leaves and closes the door behind her. I sit on my bed for a long time, still holding my grandmother's letter. I think about what she said, and for the first time in my life, I let myself wonder what would be possible if I didn't take over two oaks. What would my life look like if it wasn't set here in the place where I've spent my entire life up to this point? Chapter 18 Caleb I'm sorry to wake you up early. I'm at the store and can't find the flower you ordered last week. Any idea if it came in yet? The shelf looks bare, and I'd hate for us to run out. You know how the ladies get when they can't make biscuits in the morning. 
My mom's voice is more frantic than usual, something I've noticed in the last few weeks. The stress of the accident must finally be taking its toll. Isn't Pat there with you? He ordered it and should have been there to receive the latest truck. Not yet. He said he'd be running a little late this morning, so I got here early to get a head start. If I don't, your father will try to overdo it. I think quickly and try to remember what I saw last night when I walked through the stock area in the back. Check the pallets by the loading dock. If it isn't there, see if Pat placed the order or not. I'm pretty sure he did, though. He's been doing well, hasn't he? Mom sounds proud of her second born. And for good reason. He's picking up quickly on stuff. I think we've all underestimated him. This could be good for him, I say. Every word is the truth. My twin brother has done well and picked up a lot of the slack dad and I have created. He's seeing a girl in Greenville, my mother says. I think that's why he's late. I make a noncommittal noise. Don't be like that. Your brother has a right to happiness. I just hope he's bringing her home soon to introduce her to us. What do you think I'm like? I ask, genuinely curious. A little backwards and old-fashioned for someone your age. She is roaming around. Found it. I'm not old-fashioned, I say, a little put out by the suggestion. Yes, you are, but don't worry. Your secret's safe with me. What secret is that? I ask. You and Rose, sneaking around. I heard that she's been spending some time at your place. What? We've been so careful. Someone saw her leading your place late at night. Why don't you bring her over? Oh, maybe we can have both of you with your women over for dinner this weekend. How fun would that be? Rose was bringing over some food. Leftovers. She worries about me living on my own. Because we're friends and work together. At least that's what we want everyone to think. Or she wants everyone to think that, and no matter how tired I am of it, I'm not about to betray her trust. Right. Well, I found the flower, and you have to go to work, she says. I do. One glance at the clock on the microwave tells me that I'm running late. I grab my wallet and keys and walk to the door. I'll let you go, she says. Let me know about dinner. The line goes silent, and I shake my head. Her words still ring through my mind as I drive to Two Oaks. I hope Rose had a chance to think about our conversation yesterday and that she is ready to finally have that conversation with her dad. When I see Mr. Baker walk out of the barn, looking at me without a speck of friendliness on his face, I wonder if I pushed my luck. Don't tell me Rose was right, I mutter as I kill the engine. Caleb, I need to talk to you, Mr. Baker says, striding toward me. Sean sticks his head out the door, looking triumphant, before walking back into the barn. I don't see Rose anywhere. Of course, sir. Something I can help you with? I ask, walking briskly to meet him halfway. It's a little late for that. We've been dealing with this mess all night. Almost lost him in the process, the older man says. Lost who? Sean is obviously fine, and with Tom and Lily back at school, there are no other men on the ranch as far as I know. Diablo. What happened? I ask. You fed him moldy hay cubes, that's what happened. Mr. Baker takes another step closer and stares right into my eyes. What? Did you, or did you not feed Diablo hay cubes yesterday before you left? He asks. Of course I did. Sean asked me to. You were there. And you didn't notice they were full of mold? He asks. I shake my head. They looked fine to me, and Diablo ate them without hesitation. Not that I was entirely sure what they were supposed to look like. Of course he'd eat them. It was your job to make sure they were okay. What happened? I ask. What do you think? He's a horse. He's been colicky all night. Around two this morning, I thought we were losing him. That came out twice. He's finally getting better. I'm so sorry. If you'll show me what. He shakes his hand. No, Caleb. 
I can't afford to have you make mistake after mistake. This time, it almost cost me my most valuable horse. I need you to leave. I stare at him, trying to comprehend what's happening. I see Rose walk out of the barn, Sean falling close behind her. You need to leave, Caleb. Now. You're fired. Don't come back. He turns and walks to meet his daughter. Rose asks him something I can't hear, then shoots me a look across her father's shoulder that tells me everything I need to know. She's not going to stand up for me or defend me. She certainly isn't about to tell her father that she's in love with me. If that's what she's been feeling. I get in my truck and make the drive down the long alley leading up to the two large oaks one last time. I'm done with this place. I'm at my place, pouring myself a cup of coffee when my phone rings. It's Rose. Part of me is tempted to let it go to voicemail. But the other part of me is curious about what she has to say for herself after what went down this morning. Hey, how are you holding up? Rose asks when I answer. How do you think? I got fired, and you didn't say one word. Well, Rose goes quiet, and I can feel the anger rising in my chest. Well, what? You didn't. After everything, I figured you'd stand up for me. It was Diabolo, and you were the one giving him hay cubes. Seriously? That's why you called? To rub it in? I ask. Of course not. I called to check on you. See how you're doing. As far as I could tell, those hay cubes were fine. I've thought a lot about this since I made it home to my place. I did a couple of Google searches, and from everything I've learned, I should have been able to see and smell if something was off. Diabolo wouldn't have gotten that sick if they'd been fine. We were up all night, walking him around. Without the vet coming out when he didn't, I don't think he would have made it. I'm glad he pulled through. Diabolo and I may not be fast friends, but I didn't wish the big stallion any ill will. Me too. And I should have checked those cubes. Insisted on feeding him myself. They were fine. Completely dry and sweet-smelling. There was no sign or scent of mold. I put as much confidence in my voice as I can muster. There had to be. And then there was the incident with Paisley going lame and the tack going missing. None of which was my fault. A lot of weird stuff happened over the past seven to ten days. All of it blamed on me. And Sean happened to be around for all of it. You keep saying that, but I wonder. If that's how you feel, what are we doing here, then? I ask. My voice sounds cold, even to me. This doesn't have to change anything between us. I still want to spend time with you. Rose's voice is quiet, almost hesitant. Did you tell your father about us? I ask, brusquely. Not yet. Are you going to? Of course. Soon, Rose promises. I'm tired of waiting around, Rose. Either we're dating, officially, or we're done. Your choice. I hang up before she can get another word in. Part of me expects her to call me back, but my phone stays silent. I pace around my apartment, regretting the coffee. I feel on edge, caged in. When I can't take it anymore, I get in my truck and head to the store. Anything is better than climbing the walls at my place. What's wrong with you, my brother asks the moment I walk in the door. He's sitting in the office, going through paperwork. Don't ask. Can you give me something to do? I ask. Shouldn't you be washing some horses or something? He raises an eyebrow and scans my face. Not anymore. I'm done with two oaks and horses. What I need is something to do. Keep busy. I pace back and forth in the small office space, too keyed up even to stand still. All right. Come with me. There's a truck that needs unloading. Patrick leaves the office, and I follow him. Twenty minutes later, we are both soaked in sweat, working so fast we're both out of breath. What should have taken the better part of the morning is almost done. Ready to talk about this? Patrick asks. I take a deep breath and stop, 
leaning against the stack of canned vegetables that we moved. I am. When I'm done recalling everything leading up to this morning and my unpleasant encounter with Mr. Baker, he lets out a huff. That's messed up, man. If you ask me, my money is on Sean. He's had his eye on Rose from day one. And I don't think it's because he's attracted to her. What do you mean? I ask, looking at my brother. Something he said when we were playing darts. I didn't get it at the time, but he called her his meal ticket. That doesn't make sense. He's only at the Two Oaks for a year or so. His family has their own place, and from the way he tells it, he's going to inherit it in a couple of years. Maybe he's out for bigger and better things. Or plans to combine the two businesses? Maybe. Doubt it, though. He's from up in North Carolina. It's a good four-hour drive. Wouldn't make much sense to have two horse ranches that far apart. I shake my head. None of this is making much sense. Maybe it's about the money. I'm sure Two Oaks would fetch a good price if it came on the market. Maybe. But I can't see Rose ever agreeing to a sale. And it was hard to believe that this was about horse stock. Not when the guy almost killed the prize stallion. Something's not right here, Patrick says and gets back to work. My mind is reeling with possibilities, but nothing makes any sense. Chapter 19 Rose What happened out there earlier? I heard a whole lot of commotion an hour or two ago. Mom hands me a cup of coffee and motions for me to take a seat. I am dead on my feet. Dad fired Caleb. I don't have the energy to get into a lengthy explanation. Over Diabolo? she asks. I nod. How is he? Better? Yes. He's through the worst of it and will make it. I hope that means your dad will come in to get some food and some rest. She sighs and looks almost as tired as I feel. Mom didn't spend the whole night with us in the stable, but I doubt she got any sleep either. He's talking to Sean. I'm sure he'll be in any minute. I yawn. Good. She pours herself the last of the coffee and makes another pot. With that done, she gets back to kneading the bread dough she was working on when I walked in. I can't believe he fired poor Caleb. This wasn't his fault. He's the one who fed Diabolo the hay cubes. The words come out of my mouth, but they don't sit right with me. I should have done it or at least walked over there with him. Do we know that's what's caused it? Mom asks. I shrug. I've wondered about the same thing since Sean brought it up and showed us the moldy cubes. What else could it have been? Even if it was, that's an honest mistake. Especially if he didn't know what he was looking for. My mom's upset and letting it out on the bread dough. I know. But you know how dad gets. And it's Diabolo. The most valuable horse on our property and my father's pride and joy. It took him decades to breed the impressive stallion. It's not right. I'm going to talk to him. She wipes the flour off her hands. I'd at least wait until after he's gotten some sleep. I will. And you should get some, too. She's right. Despite the coffee, I'm about to fall asleep right here at the kitchen table. I head upstairs and fall face first on my bed. I'm asleep by the time my head hits the pillow. An hour later, I sit up, feeling slightly better. I head downstairs and peek into the living room where my dad's passed out on the couch. Sports news is playing softly in the background. The kitchen is empty, the bread dough rising in a bowl on the counter, covered by a clean kitchen towel. I pour myself a glass of water, gulp it down, and head outside. What I need is some fresh air and a little time away from anything and everything. Feel better? My mom asks when I walk into the stables. She's at the far end, looking in on Marigold and Star. Getting there. How's Diabolo? See for yourself. The smile on her face tells me what I need to know, but I still walk over and see for myself. He's standing upright, munching on the little bit of hay we're letting him have, looking thoroughly annoyed. I look around. 
My mom and I are the only two people in the building. Your dad's sleeping, and I sent Sean up to his room, too. Mind if I go for a ride? I ask. I know she's tired as well, but Diabolo looks like he's through the worst of it, and I doubt mom will sleep until dad gets up. Not at all. It'll do you good. You look pale. She reaches up and feels my cheek. Her hands smell of yeast and horse. Scents that will always remind me of my childhood. I walk up to Buttercup, who's almost as put out as Two Oaks' famous stallion. Don't worry. You're still my favorite and always will be, I reassure my mare, before I saddle her and lead her outside. As we take off across the open countryside, I slowly feel like I can breathe again. My head clears and I get a chance to think about everything that's happened in the last 24 hours. And something isn't right in all of this. Problem is, no matter how hard I try, I can't quite put my finger on it. When we left Two Oaks, I had no idea where to go. I got on Buttercup and took off across the nearest field. Somehow, after a long two-hour ride, we end up on the back pasture and the large oak tree where we had our picnic less than two weeks ago. Buttercup is breathing heavily and eyeing the creek that runs through this area of my family's property. Let's take a break. I hop off, secure the reins, and let her roam. I stretch my legs and walk to the oak where Caleb and I shared that kiss. Not our last, but possibly my favorite one. Is there such a thing as a favorite kiss or does the kids' rule apply? You know that you're supposed to love all of your offspring equally? I lean my head against the rough bark of the trunk and wonder if I'm losing my marbles. I pull my phone from my pocket and call the one person who will help me hash this out. Lily, got a minute? For you, always. Give me a second to step outside. Lily says something I can't understand before slamming a door. Okay, I'm here. What's up? Did I pull you away from something important? I ask. Not really. I can use a break from the study group. Are you sure? This isn't that important, I say, feeling guilty about pulling her away. Yeah right. You wouldn't have called me in the middle of the day if it wasn't important. What happened? I give her a quick rundown of everything. Something doesn't feel right. Aside from the fact that you threw Caleb under the bus? Lily asks. I didn't do that. You didn't stand up for him either. And if I had to guess, you didn't tell dad about you and him either, did you? I shake my head before realizing how ridiculous that was. I didn't. He asked me to when I called him. It's a bad time. For you, maybe. Unless you're serious about this guy, my sister says. I am. Then it's about time you showed him that. I swallow hard. She's right. You don't think he's responsible for Diabolo getting sick, do you? Lily asks when I don't say anything else. I'm not sure. Something feels off. Caleb was the one feeding him the hay cubes, but he swears they were fine. Not that he'd know. Of course he'd know. I'm pretty sure Caleb knows what mold smells like. And honestly, I doubt Diabolo would have eaten it if there was something off about it. He's a glutton for food, but also pretty picky. I don't know. Seriously, Rose. Stop listening to Dad and that Sean guy. What does your gut tell you? Lily asks. It wasn't Caleb's fault. If anything, it was mine. I should have. No. If anything, it's Sean's fault. I saw him messing with the hay cube barrel when I was home and you do know he keeps bribing Diabolo with sugar cubes, which probably aren't helping his digestion. It wasn't Caleb's fault, and it wasn't yours. Only question is, what are you going to do about all of this? That's the million-dollar question, isn't it? I ask, closing my eyes and feeling the warm rays of the sun on my face. Not a million-dollar one. Just the one that's going to make or break your heart. Right, I snort. By the way, did I tell you that Dad thinks the world of Sean? He keeps hinting that he and I would make a perfect match. 
Seriously? That guy is an arrogant, she pauses, and I don't have to be there with her to know it's all she can do to keep from finishing that sentence. He is, but he's also a good horseman and a pretty savvy business guy to boot. He's introducing dad to new potential customers with deep pockets. Like we need that. Two Oaks has a waiting list of foals that's a mile long. But for how long? And that's not all. He found someone giving us a great deal on the hay we have to buy in for the winter. Will you stop and listen to yourself? Lily says. You aren't seriously considering a relationship with that guy because of what he can do for dad. And two oaks. What are you? Living in the Middle Ages? All Sean has to do is offer dad a couple of horses for you? I burst out laughing at the ridiculousness of her statement. But she had a point. I'm not considering dating Sean. Then what? Maybe this isn't the best time to stir up dust about this whole thing. Diabolo is fine. Caleb has his job at the store. And you're both miserable, Lily says in the deadpan voice. You're making excuses. Why? What if I'm too late? I've been stringing Caleb along for months. And I feel horrible about it. And scared that I ruined the best thing that's happened to me. Only one way to find out. I hate it when my little sister is right. Speak of the devil, I mutter. Sean is waiting for me when Buttercup and I make it back to Two Oaks. He steps up and takes her reins. I don't need help. In case you forgot, I've been riding longer than I've been walking. Oh, come on, don't be like that. He insists on helping me down. Thanks, I bite out when he holds on a little longer than necessary. I take a step back and take Buttercup's reins from him. Any time. And I mean that, he says with a wink. He falls into step beside me and grabs a brush the moment I tie Buttercup off to brush her down. You don't need to do this, I say, hoping he'll leave. Of course he doesn't. The man is nothing if not persistent. Why don't we head down to the tipsy cow tonight? I think we both deserve to let off some steam now that Diabolo is out of the woods. I don't think so. All right. How about dinner at the diner then? Or we can head down to Greenville if you're in the mood for something fancier. Maybe hit a club after? His eyes glimmer with excitement. Sean. I try to think of a way to let him down easily, then realize it isn't going to work. He hasn't gotten any of my hints so far. I'm not interested in going out with you. Not tonight, not ever. All right, no worries. I'll take it as a challenge to change your mind. He tosses the brush on the shelf and strides off, whistling some tune. He's nuts. That's the only explanation, I say to Buttercup, who snorts in return. I get her settled in her stall with a fresh ration of hay and head inside for a long hot shower and some food. Dinner is ready by the time I make it back downstairs, my hair still damp. My parents and Sean are sitting at the table, fried chicken and mac and cheese in front of them. That looks great, I say, pulling out my chair to sit down. How was your ride? Mom asks, fixing me a plate with more food than I can possibly eat. It was nice. I talked to Lily too. She says hi, and she knows she owes you a call, I say, biting into a chicken leg. The coating is crispy, the meat juicy and flavorful. Not that I'd expect anything else from my mom's cooking. Next time, give me a bit of warning, and I'll come with you. It's always more fun to ride with someone else, don't you think? Sean reaches across the table and holds the basket of biscuits out to me, his eyes never leaving mine. Thanks. I shove a fork full of mac and cheese into my mouth. We're thinking of heading down to the tipsy cow after dinner. You don't mind, do you? Sean asks my father. Not at all. You both need a little time to relax after all this, Dad says, scooping more mac and cheese on his plate, earning him a frown from my mother. Your cholesterol, she says softly, putting her hand on his. I'm too exhausted to go out. I'm going to call it a night after dinner. 
Maybe catch up on some paperwork, I say, swallowing my annoyance at Sean along with my food. Tomorrow then. It's nice seeing the two of you, getting along, Dad says, raising his glass of tea to Sean. I take a large bite of chicken to keep from saying something neither one of my parents would approve of. I know. We'd make a great pair. Just imagine how much fun we'd have running this place together. I choke on the chicken. Sounds good to me. I know it'll be in good hands while we're gone next month. I manage to cough up the chicken. I'm glad you agree. Sean grins at me. I stand up and slam down the glass I've been drinking out to soothe my throat. Rose? Mom asks. Sean and I are not going out. Not tonight. Not ever, as far as I'm concerned. You can both get that idea out of your mind. Now if you'll excuse me. I leave the room and walk upstairs. I can't take any more of this nonsense tonight. What I need is a word of advice from someone kind. There's one of grandmother's letters left, and tonight feels like the perfect time to read it. Chapter 20 Caleb Hand me those magazines, Caleb, Mom says, holding her hands out. I pull them from the cardboard box they were shipped in and cut the string that ties each small stack of individual issues. I watch her arrange them on the magazine display rack that looks like it's been here since the 60s. It probably has, and I remember painting the whole thing at least twice since we got here. You're quiet. Still nothing from Rose, she asks, her eyes scanning me carefully. Not since yesterday. It's never easy to watch a dream die. I look up. Something in her voice makes me think there are things she's given up in her life. For the first time, I wonder how much she was part of the decision to move here. I made a call. Maybe it will help. She puts her hand into the pocket of the apron she wears in the store to keep her dresses clean and pulls out a slip of paper. I take it and look at the few words scribbled down in her handwriting. It's an address in Denver and a phone number. What is this? I ask. Uncle George's contact information. She turns and busies herself rearranging perfectly stacked and organized magazines. What did you do? I've heard of this uncle of my mother's and have a faint recollection of him coming for a visit once before we moved to Linden. I emailed him the picture of your painting. He was impressed. When I told him you had a bit of free time, he offered you a job at his gallery in Denver. Why? I told you. He thinks you have talent. Uncle George wants to take you on as an apprentice. Show you the ropes and give you a place to showcase your art. He doesn't have any children of his own. Who knows? You could take over the place and build the life you've always wanted out there. It's very nice of you. At least think about it. I've seen you around Rose. I know how much she means to you, but... But Rose might not feel the same way about me. Which was pretty obvious by the fact that she still hasn't called. Still hasn't told anyone about us. Promise me you'll at least think about it, Mom says, pulling me out of my head. I will. It could be your one chance to see if you can make it as an artist. She turns and looks out of the window. Something tells me she had a similar chance and didn't take it. It's tempting, I say, handing her more magazines. But? There's something I need to do first. Let's call it a favor for a friend. I walk into the back and pull out my phone. One quick Google search later, I know exactly where Sean Perkins comes from. Are you seriously going out there to spy on the guy? Patrick asks. Something isn't right about him, and Rose and her family have a right to know what that is. I throw a change of clothes into my duffel bag. And you're the man for the job? Patrick asks. Can't they hire a private investigator? I'm not sure they know how shady he is. They still believe it was my fault Diablo almost died. He even had Rose wrapped around his little finger at this point. I can't help but imagine the two of them together, dancing at the tipsy cow again. Her dad would love that. On paper, Sean is exactly the man he wants for his daughter. The perfect partner to run two oaks. Unlike me, 
the grocery clerk. Is she worth it? My brother looks at me when I dash out of the bathroom, toothbrush and razor in hand. I toss both of them in the bag and zip it shut. She is. In that case, get out of here. I'll take care of everything at the store. What about Dad? I ask. I can handle Dad. Go! The sooner you leave, the sooner you'll be back. Mom wants me to go to Denver, I say, picking up my bag. I heard. What do you think? I think it's a great opportunity. If living the artist's life is what you want. It's been my dream for a long time. And it would be a long way from Rose. A chance to start over. Sure you don't want to head out there now? I can't do that, I say. Part of me wishes I could. Because you love her. I get it. In that case, I'll repeat. Get out of here and come back when you can. Patrick opens the door for me and ushers me out. His words ring in my ears as I make my way out of Linden. The four-hour trip until I pull up to the long drive leading up to the main house of Lucky Acres Ranch gives me plenty of time to think about how I feel about Rose. What it doesn't do is give me any clarity on how she feels about me, deep down in that heart of hers. In the end, it doesn't matter. I do love her, and that love led me here. To some random horse ranch in the middle of North Carolina. I get out of my truck and stretch my legs. The place is quieter than two oaks. And larger. At least from what I can see from here. I take the stairs leading up to the front porch two at a time and ring the doorbell. There's no answer. I ring it again. Same results. I step back down to the drive and look around. I finally see someone walk out of a barn a quarter of a mile down the property. Can I help you? The older man asks. I hope so. I'm looking for Mr. Perkins. That doesn't happen to be you? I hold out my hand. The man shakes his hand. I'm not. I work for him. Any idea where he is? There's a horse I'm interested in. I resist the urge to cross my fingers and hope he doesn't ask me any questions about what horse. He's at a rodeo down in Georgia. Won't be back for a few days. Was he supposed to meet you here? He looks me up and down. I shake my head. I came out on a whim. Should have called. I guess I'll try again next week. I turn to leave. Call next time. This is private property, the man says, and I get the feeling I didn't fool him. I will, I call over my shoulder and drive off, trying to figure out what to do next. The one thing I'm not ready to do is give up. Rockville is bigger than Linden, but it's still a small town. Someone around here has to know Sean. I pull into the parking lot of the first motel I come across. It's less than a mile from the ranch, and there's a bar across the street. It's a long shot, but what else can I do to learn more about the guy who's trying to steal the woman I love? Chapter 21 Rose Max, what are you doing here? I thought you weren't coming in for a few more days. I pull my best friend into a tight hug. It's been ages since I've seen him. Easy there. Happy to see you too, Rose, but please don't break me before the big day. Max has that huge, happy grin on his face that I've missed so much. Maeve wouldn't be too happy with me, would she? I shoot back. He shakes his head, still grinning widely. Not at all. I'm pretty sure she started planning her wedding when she was six years old. And had no idea you'd be the groom standing next to her, I say. Definitely not. It's part of why Max and I pretended to date for years. We didn't stop until I fell for Caleb and Maeve finally realized that Max was perfect for her. Even if he was her best friend's younger brother. Where is your bride-to-be? I ask, looking around for the now-famous actress. Still on set. She'll be here as fast as she can. Until then, I have a honey-do list a mile long to keep me occupied. I bet. I want to hear all about it, and I promise to help where I can. I might take you up on that. And I want to hear all about how things are going with you. 
And Caleb. I groan. That isn't going so well. Long story, he asks. I nod my head in agreement. How about lunch? Meet me at the diner in an hour? Max asks. I'd love that. When he leaves, I rush through the morning chores. Even Dad notices. In a hurry for a reason, he asks. I'm meeting Max for lunch. The guy she used to date all through high school, he says to Sean, who's busy working in the stall across from Buttercups. We're friends. And don't be getting any ideas, Dad. His wedding to Maeve is still on. I'm refusing to let anything ruin my good mood. My friend is back, and once I talk to Caleb, all will be right in the world. Go on, take off. Sean, and I will finish up. Dad motions for me to leave, and I take him up on it after taking leave from my girl, Buttercup. A long hot shower and a short drive to the diner, and I'm sitting across the table from Max. Each of us has a bowl of Dolores's famous chicken and dumplings in front of us. You weren't kidding. That's quite the list, I say, staring at the piece of paper Max slides across to me. I have help. Amy and Leo are helping, as is Maeve's family. He pulls the list back. Anything I can do? I ask. Maybe, but first tell me what's going on. Where's Caleb? He asks, striking straight at the one sore in my momentary bliss. We had a bit of an argument. I'm giving him some time to cool his heels. I quickly recount everything that's happened over the past few days. I think you're wrong, Max says, taking my hand. I don't think you're letting Caleb, what did you call it, cool his heels. You're scared you messed up, aren't you? I swallow and put the spoon down. Maybe. What are you going to do about it? Sit here and wait for things to change? That's not the rose I know and love. Max reaches across the table and squeezes my hand. I should go talk to him, shouldn't I? That would be a start. And stop this childish game of keeping our relationship secret. I don't know why I did it. Because it felt real. And with real love comes real pain. It was a lot easier when we were pretending, wasn't it, he says. It was. And maybe the years spent pretending to be with Max when we'd never been more than friends was the reason for my behavior. It's like a film lifts from my eyes, and for the first time I see this entire situation from Caleb's point of view. I've been playing games with him, haven't I? I ask, disgusted by what I'd done to the man I love. I wouldn't call it that. You were protecting yourself. And hiding behind the fear of your father's disapproval, Max says, letting go of my hand. Grandma Iris was right. Your grandmother? Max looks confused. I tell him about the letters, including the last one. She warned me not to let Dad push me into something I don't want. What else? Max's eyes are curious, his voice soft. She told me that throughout Two Oaks' long history, women have made the biggest difference. They were the ones responsible for its growth and longevity. She says it's my turn, and that I don't need a man by my side to do well. Very progressive of her, but ouch. That's not what she meant. She wants me to be happy and told me in the last letter that I should marry for love, not the ranch. Two oaks will continue on, no matter what. Smart woman. He nods his head. Only question is, what's your next move? I stand up and grab my purse. Go see Caleb and fight for what we had. What we have. That's my girl. Go get M. Max calls after me as I stride out of the diner and head to my car. The first place I try is his apartment. He's not there. I'm tempted to call or text him, but this is a conversation we need to have in person. I pull up to Lyndon's grocers and walk inside. Rose, can I help you with something? Patrick asks. Yes. You can tell me where your brother is. We need to talk. Patrick turns his head and looks over my shoulder. He's not here. Do you know where he is? I ask, tapping my foot. 
I'm anxious to get this over with and make sure all is right between Caleb and me. Not exactly. He had to leave town but should be back any time now. Any time as in today? I ask, forcing eye contact. Absolutely. I'll let him know you're looking for him the moment he gets in. Patrick pulls his phone from his packet and walks off. What's wrong with you? Lunch didn't go as planned? Sean asks when he sees me in the tack room. I've spent the past half an hour cleaning and rearranging things. I need to keep my hands busy or my mind runs away with thoughts about what might be or could be. What I want to do is take Buttercup out for another long ride, but I don't want to miss Caleb if he calls or stops by. Lunch was fine. Max is a good friend. Your dad told me about him. And about the two of you dating for years. That couldn't have been easy, watching him fall for another woman. Sean walks over and tries to put his arm around me. I shrug him off. I have no patience for this right now. Oh, come on. Don't be like that. You and I could be great together. All I need is a tiny chance. He sounds desperate and keeps invading my space. I thought I made myself clear. I'm not interested. I move to leave the room, and his hand darts out and grabs my arm, pulling me back into the small tack room. Don't you see that we're perfect together? We have so much in common. What's wrong with giving us a chance? His tone is becoming more desperate. Because I love Caleb. I pull my arm away, but his grip tightens. Across his shoulder, I see my father standing in the door. He's heard every word. Or at least the last few. Sean, step away. Go walk it off. I need to talk to my daughter, and then you, and I will have a little chat. Man to man. Mr. Baker, this isn't what it looks like. Sean drops his hand, and I rub my arm. Leave. Now. Dad walks into the room that's too small for all three of us and stands beside me. Sean shoots me one last look. It's a mixture of rage and desperation. A cold shiver runs down my back as I watch him leave the tack room and the barn. Are you okay? Dad puts his arm around me and sits me down on a crate. I'm fine. I hope Sean's finally getting the message that I'm not interested in that thick head of his. I wrap my arms around myself. I think I'm partially to blame for all of this. He seemed like such a good fit. I may have encouraged him to. It's okay. I mean, not really. But I have a feeling he wasn't going to give up, no matter what. You really care for Caleb, don't you? Dad asks. I do. And I'm sorry you found out about it like this. I should have told you a long time ago. Then your mother was right. She's been telling me there's something going on between you two. I told her she's been reading too many of those lovey-dovey books. He laughs, but there's no joy in the sound. She knew? I ask, surprised. Mom never said a word to me. Not much gets past that woman. Unlike me, apparently. Tell you what. I'm going to go have that chat with Sean and make sure he doesn't bother you again. Ever. And then you and I are taking a nice long ride along the property line. It's been a while since we've spent time together, just you and me. I'd like that. By the time he's back, I have Buttercup and Paisley saddled. Dad and I have a nice long chat during our ride, about Two Oaks, the future, and Caleb, who still hasn't called. Want me to go track him down for you? Dad asks, as we dismount. Dad, what did we just talk about? I'm a grown woman. I can handle myself. When it comes to the ranch and when it comes to the men, I choose. I lead Buttercup into the stable to unsaddle her. You're right. And I need to do a better job treating you like the partner you are. And have been for quite a few years. Your grandmother is right. You'll do great things with this place. And if you don't mind, I'd love to see those letters sometime, he says, standing behind me. I miss her, you know. We all do. 
I put away the saddle and walked down the lane to check on Marigold and Star. Where's Diabolo? I ask when I notice he's gone. He's not here? My father strides down to meet me. Do you think Sean took him out for a ride? I ask. He better not. Dad's lips turn into a thin line. He turns and stalks off. By the time I have the horses settled, watered, and fed, he's back. Sean's stuff is gone, and there's no sign of Diabolo anywhere. Dad looks angrier than I ever remember seeing him. Mom didn't see anything? I ask. He shakes his head. She's in town, running errands. That means. No one was here to see him leave with my prize stallion. Darn it, how could I be so blind and stupid? Dad smashes his closed fist into the side of the stall. Maybe it's nothing. Or maybe he let him out, and Diabolo is somewhere here on the ranch, roaming around. I'm grasping at straws, but even I am not willing to consider that Sean would steal a horse. Both our heads turn to the stable door when we hear the sound of a familiar engine outside. Caleb. I rush outside and come to a stop when I see the grim expression on the face of the man I've been looking for all day. Chapter 22 Caleb I can't believe his parents kicked him out and disinherited him, Rose says when I tell her about the information I'd gleaned at some shady bar in North Carolina last night. My head was aching from the bourbon I drank, matching a neighbor of his shot for shot. Nausea rolls through me, and it's not from the thought of the large bar tab I'd racked up. I can, Mr. Baker says. His eyes are dark, his jaw tight. I don't blame him. Not when it seems that the jerk made off with Mr. Baker's prize animal. From what I can tell, he's been cutting corners and skimming off the top for years. I guess his dad finally had enough and decided Lucky Acres would be better off in the hands of his little brother. And here he made it sound like he was taking over. It explains why he was pushing so hard for me and him to get together, Rose says, rubbing her arm. My eyes zero in on the spot. What did he do? I bite out. Nothing I couldn't handle. Besides, he's gone. Let's focus on what's important. Getting Diablo back. I'm not giving up so easily, but this isn't the time or the place. She's right. The horse has to be our priority. I'm done playing. I'm calling the sheriff. Mr. Baker turns to walk into the house. Why don't we drive into town? See if anyone's seen him. Maybe someone recognized his truck, I say. He had to have a trailer if he took Diablo off the property. If not, there are a dozen places he could have hidden him right here on Two Oaks, Rose says. Mr. Baker turns back and looks at both of us. You're right. Rose, give him Buttercup and check the obvious spots. Caleb, if you don't mind, drive into town and see what you can find out. If you run into my wife, tell her I need her here at home. I'm going to get in touch with the sheriff and see what he can do. We'll meet back here in two hours. You got it, sir. I dig in my pocket for the keys I stashed there a few minutes ago and turn to get back into my truck shooting one last look at Rose. Our eyes connect, and I can't help but feel hope rising in my chest. Caleb. Thank you. For everything. And needless to say, you're welcome back to work for me anytime. I never should have fired you in the first place, Mr. Baker says. I appreciate that. Let's find Diabolo, and then we can talk. I get in my car and drive back into town. With the bar closed, my first stop is the diner. I've seen a trailer on that empty lot behind me. It was still there when I came in this morning, Dolores says. I follow her outside. How long has it been there? Couple of weeks. Never saw anyone around it, and it wasn't hurting anyone. I didn't see any harm in it. Dolores walks around the side of the building and comes to a sudden stop. I almost bump into her. That's weird. It's gone. She turns to look at me. Do you know anything about this? I might. I'll tell you all about it if my hunch is right. I turn and jog to my truck. I have to get back to the ranch, 
I call over my shoulder. Mr. Baker and I are finished talking to the sheriff when Rose and Buttercup gallop up and come to a stop in front of the house. Anything? Her father asks. Rose shakes her head. I looked everywhere. No sign of Diabolo or that he's been anywhere on the ranch lately. I'll expand my search area. Sean has a trailer. He and Diabolo could be long gone. I almost regret the words when I see the expression on her face. What's the plan? Rose asks, hopping off Buttercup. My deputies are scanning the county. We know what we're looking for. We'll find him. I'm heading back to the office to fax the guys in neighboring counties. The sheriff tips his hat and leaves. I'm getting Buttercup some water and heading back out. Circle the Clark Place and that piece of woods down by the creek. Rose grabs the reins. I'll come with you, I say, walking beside her. If that's okay. I'd like that. I saddle Paisley while Buttercup drinks. Mr. Baker walks out the front door when we're both ready to head out. I talk to Sean's father. He stole the trailer from his family. Perkins won't report it stolen, but I have the tags to share with the police. If they are on the road, they'll find him. And if he's not, we will. Rose clicks her tongue, and Buttercup takes off at a steady pace. Paisley catches up easily. You think he's hiding somewhere close by? I ask. Probably not, but at least it's something to do. Rose slows Buttercup to an easy trot, and I follow suit. Better than staring at four walls, I say, knowing the need to do something, anything, all too well. I can't believe you went full-blown private investigator to prove to my father that Sean was up to no good. I wish I'd gotten back sooner. Before he took Diabolo, I say, We'll find him. And Caleb. It's amazing what you did. I nod. I owe you an apology, Rose says a little while later. I was an idiot for believing you had anything to do with Diabolo going colicky. It was all Sean, wasn't it? I think so. But there's no way to prove it. It doesn't make sense. Why would he put the horse in danger if he planned to steal him and take off? Rose asks. I don't think that's what he had in mind when he came to Two Oaks. More like Plan B. Rose nods. When he couldn't win me over, no matter how bad he tried to make you look. Because I love you. I nudge Paisley, and she moves closer to Buttercup. Close enough for me to take Rose's hand. Say that again. I love you, Caleb. The horses come to a stop on their own accord. And I love you. I lean to the side to kiss her, feeling like I'm about to fall out of the saddle. It doesn't matter if I do. I need to touch her, feel her lips on mine. Rose catches on quickly and meets me halfway. Our lips melt together, and I forget about horses and trailers and shady ranch hands on the run. The only thing that matters is us, in this moment, under the sun that stands high in the sky, spreading its light and warmth over us. We don't stop until Buttercup takes a nervous step forward. I sit up and look at Paisley. Both horses have noticed something we didn't when we were too busy reconnecting. There's something going on right past that thicket, Rose says. Any idea what's over there? We're not far out of town, but I'm not familiar with this particular area. Nothing but an old forest service road. Rose grabs the reins, and Buttercup takes a few cautious steps. Maybe we should approach on foot, I say. Rose nods, and we tie the horses to the low branch of an old apple tree. We inch forward through the thicket, doing our best to make as little noise as possible. Easier said than done in boots when the entire ground is littered with dry branches and twigs. It works to our advantage that whoever is out on the road is making a fair amount of noise. It's him, Rose whispers, motioning for me to catch up. Text your dad. And the sheriff, I say, taking the lead. What are you doing? Her hand rests on my shoulder, our heads close enough to hear the faint whispers we use to communicate. I'm going to stall him. I step out onto the old forest road and realize there's no need. The truck has a flat tire, and Sean is cussing like a sailor trying to change it. From the look of it, 
things aren't going so well. Need a hand? I call out to get his attention. The look on his face when he sees me is priceless. It only improves when I deck him in the jaw and the man who tried to manhandle my woman drops to the ground. What happened? Rose asks, walking up beside me. He got what he's had coming. Sean has come to and sits quietly by his truck when the sheriff pulls up, followed by the cars of two of his deputies. Rose is checking on Diablo and walks back out when she hears them. He's fine. I can't believe the two of you found him. Good work. The sheriff steps around us to talk to Sean. Thanks. It was all Caleb. Rose walks beside me and kisses me on the cheek before wrapping her arm around my waist. It's not the full truth, but close enough and if she wants me to look good in front of everyone, who am I to point out it was her idea to come right out here. I look at Rose and get the whole message. No more hiding. I put my own arm around her shoulder and pull her even closer. Mr. Baker looks at us and nods his approval. That's a pretty big trailer. I'm surprised he only took one horse. Don't think I didn't try, Sean calls from behind us. I turn and see the sheriff cuff him. Who? Rose asks, staring him down. That crazy horse of yours. She's the best mare in the place, but stubborn like a mule. Rose's face breaks into a huge smile. She gets that from me. Not my most admirable trait, she says, turning to me. I disagree. I kiss her nose. Sometimes stubbornness saves the day. I'm glad to see you know what you're getting yourself into with this one, Mr. Baker says, squeezing my arm before making his way into the trailer. If you're pressing charges, I'll take this guy down to the station, the sheriff says when Mr. Baker walks out, leading Diablo out of the trailer. You bet your bottom dollar I am. I'll meet you there as soon as I get this guy settled in at home. You're not planning on riding him bare back home? Rose says, her voice high with concern. How else am I going to get him home? Don't worry. He's still too weak to make a fuss. Wait up, we'll follow up. Rose and I race back to the horses and guide them through an opening in the brush. I can't believe he tried to take Buttercup, Rose says, leaning forward in the saddle and whispering something into her mare's ears on the way back to Two Oaks. I can't believe I hired the guy. Should have listened to you in the first place. The worst part is that I tried to get the two of you together. I'll never forgive myself for that. Mr. Baker rides next to us, Diablo happy to keep pace with the two Maras. Good. I hope that means you approve of Caleb. Rose looks at me, and my heart skips a beat or two. I do. Wholeheartedly. I've been a fool, and I have a feeling you and your mother will never let me forget it, Mr. Baker says, looking at his daughter with as much love as I feel for her. Or close to it. I sit back and enjoy the feeling that everything's right with the world. For now. Rose. This is insane. I look around the huge tent set up in the middle of Max's father's property. It easily holds 500 people and is almost filled to capacity. And that's not counting the throng of photographers that have descended on Linden for the wedding of Maeve Alden, famous actress and by far the biggest celebrity our little one-stoplight town has ever seen. It's a bit much, Caleb agrees. He cleans up nicely. That's the understatement of the century. We follow the usher to our seats. Flanked by our respective families, we sit, and Max standing next to his dad, waiting for his bride. I can tell he's nervous, and I would be too, with all this attention on him. Then the music starts, and all eyes, including mine, turn to watch Maeve walk down the aisle. She's dressed in white, silver threads running through the stunning designer gown. Her black hair, swept up in a fancy updo, provides the perfect contrast to the gown and her alabaster skin. The only splash of color is her deep, dark red lipstick. She looks every bit the star she is. Not just here, in Linden, South Carolina, but all over the country. Not that any of that matters. Today is about Maeve and Max and their love. I grab Caleb's hand when the preacher starts the ceremony. 
I'm surprised they stick to the traditional vows, but then Maeve is nothing if not surprising. I am happy to present to you, for the first time, Mr. and Mrs. Alden. We all rise and applaud. Cheers break out for the newlyweds. Did he say Alden? Caleb asks. I'm pretty sure he did. I guess Max decided to take her last name. I'm never going to let him live that down. I have a huge smile on my face and no desire to hide it, no matter how goofy it looks. From the way Caleb looks at me, I have nothing to worry about. You two lovebirds ready to congratulate the happy couple? Mom asks. She took the news that Caleb and I are an item even better than Dad. And Caleb's parents were over the moon, inviting me over for Sunday dinner the moment they found out. I wouldn't miss it for the world. I link my arm with Caleb's and get in line. Glad you two made it, Max says, spotting his own huge grin when he sees me. Congratulations, Mr. Alden, I say with a wink. And you too, Maeve. I kiss the blushing bride on the cheek. Thank you, she says, before bending down and whispering in my ear. I can't believe he went for the Alden thing. I was only joking. I heard that, Max says. It only makes sense. You need to keep the name professionally, and half of Hollywood already calls me Mr. Alden. Might as well make it official. And here I thought I could rub it in. I shake my head and leave, giving the people behind us a chance to talk to them. We join his parents when Patrick walks up, his arm wrapped around a pretty brunette, a young boy with the same hair color, holding his other hand. Guys, I want you to meet someone. Two someones actually. Caleb's twin brother looks uncharacteristically shy. Who's this? The young woman you've been seeing in Greenville? Mrs. Montgomery rushes forward and pulls her into a tight hug. I'm Gwen. And this is Philip, my son, she says. It's a pleasure to meet you. Caleb's father holds out his hand first to her, then to the boy. I'm Caleb. Patrick's twin brother. Caleb shakes hands with both of them as well. And this is my girlfriend, Rose. You don't look like twins, Philip says. We don't. But I promise you we are. Ask my mom. Born one right after the other. First Caleb, then Patrick. She crouches down and holds her hand out to the young boy. It's very nice to meet you too. Ready for another dance? Caleb asks, pulling me back onto the dance floor, before I get a chance to respond. With you, anytime. I let him pull me into his arms and sway to the slow song along with him. This is nice, he says, rubbing the small of my back. It is. It's nice that everyone knows. No more hiding. No more sneaking away to kiss you. I raise my arms and put both hands around his face, pulling him down for a long, slow kiss that lasts as long as the song. All too soon, it ends, and the DJ announces that it's time for the bride to throw the bouquet. Go. Caleb practically pushes me into the group of women gathering below the raised platform where Max and Maeve exchanged their vows a few hours ago. Maeve takes a good look, turns, and throws the bouquet of white roses right into my arms. Your turn next, she calls with a smile, and I can't shake the feeling that this was a setup. Nice catch, Caleb says when I join him. Care to sneak away one more time? For old time's sake? I follow him outside the tent, and we stroll across the pasture, to a few small trees, close to the fence line. The light of the full moon illuminates our way. The flowers are pretty. I like that silver ribbon, Caleb says when we come to a stop. They are. I wonder if I should give them back. I have no idea what the customs are when it comes to catching the bridal bouquet. It's the first time I have, and I'm sure Maeve wants it back. Not so fast. What's that dangling there? Caleb motions to one of the tails of the ribbon that holds the arrangement together. I'm sure it's nothing. I lower the flowers, eager for another kiss. Humor me, he says and something in his tone makes me look up. I raise the flowers and grab the ribbon with my free hand. 
A small object is tied to the end of it. The light of a moonbeam hits it and makes it sparkle like a diamond. My breath catches in my throat. This couldn't be? Could it? Caleb takes the bouquet from me, fiddles with it for a second and then gently places it on the ground. He gets down on one knee, right there, in the damp grass, and I'm too stunned to do anything about it. Rose Baker. I've loved you for a very long time. I can't imagine a life with anyone else. I know this is fast and unexpected, but I'm tired of wasting time. Will you marry me? I stare at him for several heartbeats, our eyes locked together. Rose? I fall to my knees, unable to speak. Instead, I kiss him, hoping that the movement of my lips against his communicates my answer. Is that a yes? he asks, out of breath, when we finally break apart. Most definitely. Yes. I'll marry you. He takes my hand and places the ring on it. We both stare at it, the square diamond catching the light of the moon again. I can't believe you tied this to the bouquet. What if I hadn't caught it? Caleb sits down on the ground, his back supported by the trunk of one of the trees, and pulls me into his lap. It was Maeve's idea, and she assured me there was no way she would miss. And you believed her? Let's say I held my breath and had my fingers crossed. He pulls me closer. It's a good thing I decided on a green dress, I say absent-mindedly, pulling up my dress to get as much of it off the ground as possible. I think we have bigger things to think about than a few grass stains, Caleb says, his lips nibbling on my ear. If you keep that up, I won't be able to think about anything, I say, suppressing my happy giggle only long enough to get the words out. Not even our future together, he asks softly. That depends. What did you have in mind for this future of ours? I ask, keeping my tone light. Something in his tone tells me this is important to him. To us. Did I ever tell you about my great uncle in Denver? Caleb asks. I shake my head. He owns a gallery and invited me to come and spend some time with him, paint, and exhibit my paintings. Colorado sounds exciting. He sits up and turns me around to face him. You'd consider moving out there? Not forever, but maybe a couple of months. Or years. It'll be a while before my dad will even consider retiring. I think it would be nice to see something else, live somewhere different. Especially if it will help with your art. Are you sure? What if we decide we like living somewhere else, he asks, his eyes scanning my face. Then we'll have to talk Lily and Tom into taking over Two Oaks. They'll graduate in a few months, and Tom liked it here. You'd seriously consider giving up Two Oaks? Caleb asks. I'd have to think about it. No, we'd have to think about it. What I know is that we have the time and the opportunity to see what's out there. Travel. Decide if Two Oaks is where we want to make our home. Who knows what else is out there? Rose Baker, you amaze me every day, Caleb says, helping me stand before rising himself. Good. I'll try to keep it that way. I hold out my hand, and he takes it, wrapping his fingers around mine and the ring that's a promise of a long and happy life together. The End This has been Dear Rose, written by Suzanne Ash. Copyright 2023, by Suzanne Ash. Production Copyright 2023, by Suzanne Ash. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe if you want me to put more of my books on YouTube. Visit my website at www.suzanneash.com for more of my books or find me on Amazon.